at. Uh, has, everybody, has everybody had a chance to look at the agenda? And um, is there any feedback or anything that they like to see added or changed on that? No, okay. All right, so um, welcome everybody. And um, we have uh, new members with us today. Um, I see Jan, right? Do I see Jan? No, sorry. <laughs> okay, we'll start over. I, <laughs> I see Linda here, um, Jay Rosenbeck, um, and is Carl Davis here? No, okay. So just the two new members um, so far have, have joined us, right? Did I, is there somebody else hanging out that I didn't mention? Okay, we have we have five new members, but um, two of them are here right now. Do you want to go ahead and um, introduce yourselves? Maybe just say um, you could talk about a little bit about your background or why you decided to join EPAC, or if you have a specific um, interest um, related to the environment that that wanted you know kind of compelled you to join. Um, anything like that. Either. Either of you, Jay or Linda, want to jump in and say hello? Go ahead, Linda. I was going to say, go ahead. You're already unmuted. <laughs> um, my name is Linda James. I've been I've been a resident of Alachua County since my undergrad in UF. <laughs> so I kind of got to UF and never left. Um, however, I did do my master's in community and economic development, which is an equivalent to um, uh, basically rural planning and, and that type of thing. Um, so I, I work mostly in international development work. I've been, I've worked abroad and now I'm working from Gainesville, which is wonderful. Um, largely just running some USAID projects from where I stand. Um, so I was interested in connecting locally um, since I'm doing international work to kind of give me a little balance <laughs> of reality. Um, and so I wanted to volunteer by serving on a board, on a committee. So. Here I am. Nice. Well, we're glad to have you. And, um, you know, every like different perspective always brings something new to the table. So I'm um, really happy to have your perspective here. Thank and you. thanks for joining. Um, go ahead, Jay. Why don't you uh, say hello? Yeah. My name is Jay Rosenbeck. I'm a, uh, a professor emeritus, University of Florida. My professional training was in speech pathology. My work was in rehabilitation science. I retired from the university and knew that I wanted to do something with the next act of my life uh, and the environment and threats to it uh, seemed to be most compelling. I joined the League of Women Voters, became the co-chair of the Natural Resources Committee of the League um, as part of building better relationships with the League and other groups in town. Uh, I uh, joined Enquanda Jaws Environmental and Climate Justice Committee and have uh, been a member of that committee for four or five years. Uh, and I realized that there were other opportunities. Talked to somebody on a plane, actually. And uh, her advice was, see if you can join a citizens committee. So when this opportunity came up, I took the advice I got on that plane and uh, I put my name in and here I am and I'm honored to be part of this group. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, again, it sounds like you have a lot to bring to the table and a lot of experience in different organizations. So um, yeah, happy to have you here. Thank you. And um, did anybody else join us, new members? Oh, Linda says she's also a member of the Junior League. Um, okay, awesome. Um, all right, well, if we, um, if some of them, um, if uh, the, the remaining three join us later, we can always um, circle back and do introduction for them um, um, later on in the agenda. So why don't we go ahead and um, jump into um, Gus, uh, Gus Olmos is the Alachua County Solid Waste and Resource Recovery Director. Um, and 
Uh, he's here today to talk about the um, EcoLoop project, um, kind of give an overview of the project and um, some of the proposals for um, businesses that um, would potentially join join the project. Is that right, Gus? Close to it. Okay. Well, go ahead and jump in and. Um, so uh, good, good evening, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you again. Uh, like Nisha said, I'm the uh, director of the Solid Waste Department, but prior to that, I used to be with the Environmental Protection Department, and I used to do what Mark is doing. I used to be the staff liaison for EPAC. So I'm very familiar with your committee and the type of work you guys do. So with that being said, uh, the eco loop is something that some of you are very familiar with it because we've been bringing this topic to EPAC uh, for a number of years, really. Uh, but since we have uh, several new members, I put together a very short presentation just to kind of get you up to speed. I mean, I know Mark sent you guys a lot of information and I don't know if you had time to go over it. I mean, it's all there, but let me just go ahead and share my screen and we'll go over the presentation. Feel free to stop me at any time and ask any questions that you may have. Okay. You seen the presentation right now? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. So for those of you who are not familiar, uh, this I, I grabbed this thing from uh, Google Maps just this morning. So Waldo Road is over here, and this is the Levita Road Environmental Park and Transfer Station. Uh, so the uh, the building over here as labeled is the um, you know, the Levita Brown Environmental Park has three main facilities within the that site. Uh, the first one is the uh, the hazardous waste facility, and that's where we take you know paint and fuels and oils and, and solvents and pharmaceuticals and electronic waste, uh, and those are you know managed in, in different ways. Uh, this one that is called SP Recycling actually has an old name. This is a uh, used to be a privately owned facility, but the county acquired it back on 2014. And this is where we manage, what you guys put in your blue and orange bin. This is where we manage the recyclables. So as you probably know, you're here, here in the county, we got a dual, what is called a dual stream system. So we got two lanes, one for fibers and papers, and the other one for glass, plastic, and aluminum. And basically what we do at this facility is we, take all these materials, they get separated, they get bailed, and they get sold as a commodity. And then this big building over here is the uh, transfer station, tipping floor. So essentially all the waste, and it's about like 90%, probably higher, of the uh, garbage that is generated within a larger county comes through our scale house and goes through this building. And once it's here, it goes into bigger vehicles, and it's transported to the um, New River landfill in Union County. Uh, right now, we are moving up between 750 and 800 tons per year. I mean, sorry, per day. Uh, so that's a lot of tonnage, and that's a lot of trips to the uh, New River landfill, which is about 35, 35 miles from Alachua County. The eco loop is this area over here. And um, basically this is a facility that the county purchased and developed and the intent is to lease it to businesses that are gonna be working in, you know, whatever you wanna call it, zero waste, waste reduction, waste management, anything that is associated with minimizing or reducing the amount of waste that is generated uh, and managed in Alachua County. So it's about 31 acres. Um, it was, uh, it, it already has the utilities, uh, you know, people, you know, they say you know, they're shovel ready parcels. So the county put a, a request for proposals to uh, see what kind of interest we got from the community. And the whole idea here is to lease this property uh, 
for businesses that want to site over here. So we put the proposal out and then we evaluated those proposals based on this criteria. You know, the, the businesses that we want to be located there, you know, they need to be within the parameters of the zero waste strategies report that was adopted by the county and the city of Gainesville early this year. I believe you have a copy there. Uh, this project is not only an environmental project, but it's also an economic development project. So it has to hit certain benchmarks. And of course it has to meet the uh, requirements of the county's comprehensive plan. And there's a master development plan for these uh, lots. So it also has to meet those items. So as far as the zero waste strategies report, um, I mean, it's a fairly lengthy document. It has a lot of specific examples, but it also has a definition of what zero waste is and what are the guiding principles behind it. So when we were looking at the, at the proposals we got, you know, whatever we wanna put in there, it needs to fit within this framework. As far as economic development, you know, we want businesses that are gonna create good jobs, many jobs, uh, with high paying uh, salaries, and if possible, a mix of professional and technical trades. Yeah, the, the comprehensive plan, uh, if you're not familiar with it, is a very large document that kind of guides the development and, and what we do here in the county. And it does have several items that deal specifically with solar waste. Uh, the one that is in bold is one that is particularly important for this um, project and basically says that the use of tires, plastics, or plastic derived materials as a fuel source or as a feedstock for a waste to energy facility is prohibited in the county solid waste stream. <laughs> so this is a change that the, the board adopted recently, maybe the past within the past five years, four or five years. Um, and this is gonna be key on how we evaluate the proposals that we received. Uh, like I said, the master development plan, it does have a list of the type of facilities that we expect to, uh, to see there. And you can see based on the slide, you know, it's a pretty flexible list. You know, so we're looking at any kind of waste related type of industry. So, so we put the bid out there and we got three proposals. We got one from Florida Express Environmental, and they are wanted to build a CND materials recovery for a construction and demolition materials recovery facility. Uh, we got one from Carbon Sweep, and they want to be build a biorefinery to produce diesel and other products made out of the, the solid waste. And what's the way they have a concept plan for the construction of a facility to produce engineer fuel? This is very similar to the fuel that is being currently used at the uh, Argo cement plant in Newberry. And I believe you have copies of all three proposals. And I think we have representatives from all three companies in attendance tonight. Uh, so the committee met on uh, Thursday of last week. Um, we reviewed the proposals. Florida Express Environmental was the highest ranked one. They got 81 points. Carbon Sweep and Waste Away had 42 points each. Uh, you know, in a nutshell, we felt that you know a CND materials recovery facility was perfect for the Eco Loop. It kind of hit all the targets we were looking for, and the low score for Carbon Sweep and Waste Away were primarily because, in our opinion, they did not need that comprehensive plan language that I mentioned before because they were using plastic as a fuel source. Uh, so that's, that's why this course were so low. So the, ne the next steps is, you know, I'm here today uh, and then I'm gonna be at the uh, Economic Development Advisory Committee on Thursday. And what I'm hoping to get is your input. You know, you're on advisory committee and I know you're right now on a workshop mode so you cannot take votes, I believe. But, uh, you know, I want to get whatever feedback you want me to convey to the board regarding the projects, our ranking, or anything else related, related to 
the eco loop uh, and the projects that we're bringing to the board. I'm gonna ask the same thing for from uh, EDAC. And then my plan is to bring staff's recommendation, your comments, and EDA comments to the board on August 9. And basically what we're recommending is that they, uh, I think I skipped that, but what we're recommending is that they authorize staff to start negotiations with Florida Express Environmental for the construction of the CND MRF. Um, and that is basically what I got. I mean, I'd be happy to discuss the projects from our point of view, but I think it will be more beneficial if you listen to the actual applicants uh, since they're here. If Gus, before you go, what was the cutoff point? You had 81 and 42 and 42. So what, what kind of makes up that score? There's no numerical cutoff points. And I guess I should have mentioned this. So um, typically when you have an RFP, you have something you want to get done and then you got three or four companies competing to do that same thing. That is not the case here. You know, the comp we could have awarded all three companies because they really are competing for space, uh, not against each other. The reason we didn't move forward, carbon sweep, and uh, was the way is because, like I said, in our opinion, they don't meet the comprehensive plan requirement. So that's not something we can recommend to the board. Hey, Gus. So I also want you to chime in. I I guess you already answered my question, but I just want to clarify. I was wondering whether they compete for the same space, but apparently not. You just explained that the those two companies they want to use plastic um, to to burn, I guess, and that's the reason you don't want to. You are hesitant. Yeah. So so it's not. Okay. Yeah. I mean, just and I'm sure they're gonna clarify this. They're not really just burning plastic. I mean, neither one is proposing your typical waste to energy facility where you take the garbage, burn it and you know generate electricity. That's not what they're doing. But within their process, I it was our opinion that they were getting stuck with that comprehensive plan policy. Uh, as far as space, we got like 31 acres. Yeah. Uh, so we could have put two of the three just based on space requirements. Okay, thank you. I guess can I, this is Scott. Um, just a quick question here. Has the county thought any more about their prohibition on burning plastics? It, it doesn't seem like there's a good alternative to it right now. Um, mm -hmm. It feels a little bit like they kind of drew an arbitrary line in the sand with no waste to energy type projects, despite the fact that actually may be the best alternative for plastic in the near term. So when we evaluated the projects, we had to do it based on the current comprehensive plan. That being said, I, I do anticipate this discussion coming up at the August 9 meeting when we bring these projects to the board. So if, if you, you know, have something you want me to convey to the board in that area, I'll be happy to do that. But um, yeah, the last time it was discussed when was that comprehensive plan language was updated. There hasn't been any discussion since. This will be the first one since that vote. I, and I, I mean, I would be interested to get other member members of EPAC's opinion on that also, obviously, before we made any kind of recommendation. But I guess my viewpoint would be right now, recycling of plastic. I, I, you may have mentioned what's currently happening, but essentially it sounds like we're using fossil fuels to prepare and then move these plastics to another location. And it's a little bit out of sight, out of mind. So it's in theory a product, but there's no reason that we may not just be sending these across the county line to be burned next door in a facility that maybe wouldn't have as stringent of requirements as Alachua County might. So currently, I mean, I'm, I'm, um, we do have a market for certain types of plastics and those are being recycled. Um, for the ones that we don't have a market, they do end up going to the landfill. Uh, I just want to point out that both Waste Away and Carbon Sweep, the way they presented their proposals, it was not an all or nothing. So they were both saying that the traditional recycling would stay in place. 
This would be for the materials that don't have a currently a traditional recycling market. So it's not, you don't have, you could do both if you wanted to. Is it, is it true that uh, some of the plastics that are being rejected right now by Alachua County are in some places in the United States being recycled so that there is a way of recycling some of these plastics? I don't know. I was just asking myself the same, the same question the other day. Maybe people are just taking it and just throwing it in the garbage and telling people they are being recycled. I mean, it's not like, I mean, the plastics we sell are sold throughout the United States. So there's no like a regional market just from us. So if somebody else has a market for them, we would have been able to find it as well. Uh, okay. Whether they're taking it, I don't know what they're doing with it. I want to. I want to make a point, and that the logic behind having this line in the uh, um, comprehensive plan. And by the way, I was there the day that this got added to the comprehensive plan, and there was quite a bit of discussion um, among the you know, various uh, members of the commission at that time, and and they did vote to put that in there. They thought it was a good idea too. So, um, but the logic basically is that if we are allowing plastic to burn, we're completely bypassing the idea of reduce and recycle and reuse, okay? What, we're what we decided to do is to just go ahead and burn it and, you know, and get rid of it that way. And of course, that's gonna put a lot of hydrocarbons, you know, more in, into the environment or into the air specifically than, than are there now. Um, if they were being, if there was a way to burn plastics that was zero pollution to the air, I might say, yeah, let's let's look at that. But there isn't at this point in time. Best thing we can be doing with plastics, I believe, is to recycle them, or actually to not use them in the first place, which you know nobody seems to be working towards that. Um, to you know to recycle them if we've got to have them, and to, you know to find some way of reusing them if possible. But um, really, you know, to burn them just isn't on my isn't anywhere on my uh, my list of of ways to handle a plastic. There's another so one uh, issue uh, regarding burning. Uh, plastics typically, as we know, uh, contain uh, chlorine and uh, uh, dioxin resulting from uh, the burning of it. And so the question then is, do we have, uh, would we have access to uh, emission, to, to technologies that would burn clean enough to meet uh, the ever increasing stringent stand, at least hopefully more stringent standards uh, in the future, because if we just start burning because we don't have an alternative for the recycle, I think that's a, an irresponsible way to, uh, to deal with the plastics because release of admissions could be far worse than maybe plastic mining as we've talked about in the past, leaving it in the, in the landfill and then mining it once the technology reaches a sufficient sophistication. The, yeah. I, I guess where I would come down on this though is I wouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good here. And right now, even the plastics we can recycle are having a carbon footprint and are going to, I would assume, plastic processing facilities that very likely are producing these same compounds. Technology for burning is arguably very good. They do this they do a lot of waste of energy in Germany. And I don't think Germany is exactly lax in their environmental standards. I would yeah, agree the true. best solution is to not use it at all, like not bring it into the process at all. That being said, I don't think we're looking at this from a life cycle standpoint, which is we're producing plastic. We're then using gas powered vehicles to drive this, sorting it, then using gas powered vehicles to take it to a landfill or if it's being recycled using gas powered vehicles to drive it to some distant location where it's then being processed, most likely using petroleum fuels. Um, I don't know exactly how the life cycle plays out for that, but um, arguably burning it is probably putting it in the ground where it will never ever ever break down. I can't imagine mining being cost effective in ever probably. For plastic. Yeah, could be. There, there was. Um, so, so I mean, that's that's my concern is we're essentially putting something in a place where it is literally never going to break down and filling up the world with trash rather than safely burning it. Power plants have very stringent air quality requirements. It's not comparable to you know the cement plants that have been discussed historically here. 
power plant requirements for air pollution are extremely stringent. Well, I know and, in England there are there's a, at least one medical waste incinerator that deals with high amounts of uh, disposable biomedical plastic uh, materials, and they produce a pretty clean flow. It would be real serve uh, the the county really well if someone could get uh, the verification of the latest technology and what the emissions are at the very best plants in Europe and bring this back as part of the argument in favor. If someone wants to pursue burning, why not have the data to show and convince? So that's my thought. Yeah, and it's still I the problem. Know. Yeah, the problem still remains, you know, that if we start to burn, that's going to be the end of the, the this, you know, discussing whether we should be using plastic or not, because there will, quote, no longer be a problem, quote, okay? I mean, we need to stop using it. And the only way we're going to stop using it is if we stop feeling like we have solutions, either putting it in the ground or recycling, you know, because as, as Scott points out very, very correctly, there's, there's a lot of, uh, of pollution coming from the recycling process. But the idea is let's, let's stop using it in the first place. And we're not going to get to that if we go to burn it. The well, thing how is, about David, require cellulose-based plastics that that are more biofriendly and and less of a of a risk? Yeah, well, someone actually makes those. They do, and but but, but there's no one imposing them in the community. You know? Yeah. So I don't know. Are you guys shopping at Trader Joe's? I mean, they have this. They have these really nice quote, quote, plastic bags, and they are made of, of plants. I mean, they are really nice. And I'm just wondering why don't other shops catch on to that? And they are not for transport, they are, but they are for produce and for wrapping meat and stuff. So, I mean, you know, there are opportunities already in that arena. Yep. Once, once again, though, reduce is the beginning of the triangle. And coming up with a solution that is quote unquote more environmentally friendly is still worse than not using something in the first place. So, I mean, it's good they have an alternative. Very often those alternatives are actually just as bad or worse for the environment. Like if you use something produced from cellulose, it is most likely being grown on an industrial farm. And mm -hmm. that is involving a huge amount of petroleum inputs. So I think trying to reduce is the best solution. That being said, I do feel like we, by saying you can't do waste to energy, I feel like we are essentially saying you can't even consider, nothing on 31 acres is going to be a full scale waste to energy facility. It's substantially too small. There's not enough water to do what they would need to do there to do a full waste to energy type process. But we are essentially blocking the ability to have creative people try to come up with creative solutions by saying yeah. we're no, not interested no, that's not in these types of projects. Allow, we, allow, we allow experimental use. We allow people who want to work towards solving the problem. We just don't allow full-blown uh, waste energy plants. Yeah. Arguably, the sure. eco loop, though, is exactly the basis for that. And they downranked two projects specifically because of this. Mm. Hey, hey, Scott and, and everybody else, of course. But since you talk about you know how they manage waste in Germany a lot, my cousin, Oh, my cousin, my nephew, just visited from Germany. He's an engineer and he quite frankly, he does not understand that they still bury their waste here. And we didn't specifically talk about plastic, but um, as you also pointed out, you know, Germany is not really um, behind the moon in terms of technology. So I also think this would be a very interesting area to explore. I'd like to hear what Amanda has to say on this, by the way. What's that? I'd like to hear what Amanda has to say Amanda on this. Amanda uh, Hi, this is Amanda. Hi. Uh, thanks for letting me talk. Thanks, Gus, for that presentation. Um, I generally fall in line with no burning in general for any of our resources, especially plastic. Um, I think there's a lot of better ways we could manage them. And I definitely agree with, with David on this point. So we need to work towards zero waste. And a lot of that will come with reducing and reusing our resources. That's definitely my standpoint. Thanks, Amanda. Um, why don't we, before, um, 
why don't we give a chance uh, for our um, the, these projects um, that are potentially going to um, be implemented to give us their presentations or um, whatever they'd like to um, present to us um, so we can get a, a better feel for for what they want to do. And um, I, I Gus, you mentioned um, we should have received the proposals. I don't see a copy of those proposals in my email attachments. Um, does anybody else, did anybody else get them or know which email they were in? Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Mark. I sent them as a second email so that without the proposer's name, it was a separate email. Number one, number two, it was the size of the file. So they were pretty sizable files, but that way, you know, for. Do you know what the title of it, the email was? I have a few from you and I've been flipping around. I can't. I can, I can, let me resend it. Um, it's the same as the previous one. Hold on. Um, yeah, it'd be nice just to have a copy of that stuff so we yeah, can I'll send it to you. refer to the details. Um, so uh, we have the um, representatives from the three um, different businesses here um, Carbon Sweep, Waste Away, and Florida Express Environmental. Um, uh, I'm not sure who's who, but um, would would either, any of you um, like to present something to us? Uh, this is Rich from Carbon Sweep. I, I would love to uh, share my screen and, and, and talk to the group. Uh, Gus, great. I defer to you if that you had an order in mind. I'm, I'm happy to go first or last. It doesn't uh -huh. matter. Whatever Anisha wants to do, she's in charge. Yeah, that's great. That's <laughs> All right, let me see if I can share my screen. Can you see that? Did I do that right? I didn't do that. Yeah, right. I can see it. You can see it? Yes. You can see the presentation. I'm sorry, I can't see the presentation, but can you see Alachua Biorefinery on your screens? Yeah, yes. it's, it's right, a bit back and forth, I can see your screen. Okay. Um, so, so let me first, at the risk of sounding patronizing, uh, this was a very stimulating and, and uh, important discussion that, that the, uh, the committee is having. The workshops are terrific. Uh, the discussions are all very current and, and relevant to what Carbon Suite wants to talk about. I, I really couldn't be happier to be invited to, to have this uh, discussion with, with your group tonight. Just quickly about me, I spent about the last 20 years in the waste uh, to value or the waste to energy sector. I've worked uh, with companies like Covanta, which uh, operates most of the waste to energy facilities in the state of Florida. I'm a Fort Myers resident. Sorry, I can't say that I'm, I'm up in Alachua right now, but I am a Florida resident. Um, and I'm a, I have a degree in environmental science and geology. So you know, I come at this business from a technical background. So I want to you know, make a couple of foundational statements. You know, words like incineration and combustion and you know, all the things that we, you know, we've talked about um, are not what Carbon Sweep does. Um, so what, what Carbon Sweep does is, is we break down plastics in a contained oxygen deprived environment at, at a molecular, even atomic level. And we use those atoms to create an entirely new product, which means those, those atoms at some point in our process cease being plastic. They become you know, a carbon or a hydrocarbon atom of, of some type. Um, so, so therefore, you know, and I, I hate to sound like I'm trying to, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, kind of split the split the group here. I mean, we, we think we qualify under your regulations, but I completely understand the spirit um, with which you, you constructed them because, you know, burning plastics and, you know, creating emissions you know, has, uh, you know, may, maybe a nasty uh, track record going back years, but I can certainly say that waste to energy plants right now with the latest emissions control devices are as clean you know, as any power source uh, with the exception of, of nuclear energy. Um, so uh, to emphasize a couple of points at the start, carbon sweep does not use plastic as a fuel. We have no combustion uh, that occurs. Uh, there's no nasty emissions in our process. We use residual plastics. And I'm gonna stop for a moment and say residual plastics. 
when's the last time anybody, you know, who perhaps, you know, there were some vegetarians on the, on the, on the call tonight. So but when's the last time anybody bought a chicken? And so that plastic film that's wrapped around meat or other food products ends up in the trash. And so what Carbon Sweep is taking is the difficult, if not impossible to recycle plastics and films and other uh, styrofoam, uh, the, 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 the piece of styrofoam that sits underneath the chicken when you buy it at the store. Um, we're, we're using those plastics, which end up in the MSW stream. We completely uh, em embrace recycling, even though, as some have pointed out, I would agree that parts of our recycling system are still not perfect, and the circular economy still needs more work. Uh, but but we're we're really targeting the residual plastics that are very difficult to recycle and don't end up in your material recovery facility, which Gus, as you pointed out, is a dual stream recovery facility. We don't want to disrupt that. We use residual plastics, we deconstruct them and reconstruct them into an entirely different product, which is renewable diesel. So if, if, if I'm gonna you know, quickly go through this, this graphic. Um, Rich, so, can I ask yeah. a quick question? Please. Um, do you guys, uh, does your company use uh, styrofoam and those types uh, of products that are unrecyclable? We, we don't necessarily use styrofoam. We don't deselect styrofoam if it's part of the municipal solid waste residue. Um, so, you know, what, what our system, uh, by the way, just a quick point, our, our projects cost about 175 to $200 million to construct, create about 100 jobs in a community, and we're not asking the Lachua County to, uh, to pay a penny for that. And frankly, we're going to reduce your cost of disposal in the process. Um, but so back to the styrofoam question, if it's part of the residual trash, we're, we're, we're going to use that because it has thermal value, but we're going to deconstruct it and reconstruct it into a renewable diesel fuel. Out of curiosity, did you consider any other possible end products other than uh, diesel fuel? Um, actually, uh, well, I mean, if you look at the chart, uh, we do make some biochar, which has some market uh, value and, and a lot of wood vinegar. Um, uh, we have a pathway to create hydrogen. Uh, that process is still under development with our technology partner. Um, so, you know, other products, uh, you know, are uh, available to us in the future. Um, the biochar may have some future applications and in, uh, in some uh, very interesting materials like graphene. So. Um, you know, our process is operating at 1100 degrees centigrade in a starved oxygen, nitrogen rich environment. Um, so in that environment, you can do a lot of interesting things with the syngas. Um, but you know, right now we're focused on making a diesel fuel, um, which, you know, under our current agreement is being sold into the UK uh, under the renewable energy directive to displace fossil fuels with renewable fuels. If that answered the questions, I'll quickly go through this chart. So again, to, to emphasize this, um, it's a simple flow diagram. So at the top left, uh, Alachua generates about 250,000 tons of garbage. Um, that, that garbage will go into a material processing facility uh, built by our partner, Bulk Handling Systems, which is one of the best manufacturers of recycling uh, systems in the, in the country. Uh, we'll pull out some residual recyclables that are in the trash. There's always some plastic that you can recover. There's some cardboard. There's other things that end up in the trash because people are people and they don't always recycle perfectly. Um, so uh, we'll generate about 30,000. We project tons of uh, commodities out the bottom of that as recyclables. Uh, but we're also going to deselect from our process about 117,500 tons of you know, inert materials, glass and other unprocessable residue that will go to a landfill. So this is not a zero landfill solution, uh, but it does reduce uh, the amount of waste going into a landfill by uh, you know, close to a third. At the end of the, of the material recovery process, we come up with 103,000 metric tons of what we call biorefinery feedstock. That includes some fiber, that includes some residual plastic, but it's basically the trash that's not worth anything else. And you can either send that to a landfill where it'll generate some methane if it's not plastic, or if it's plastic, it'll sit in the landfill forever and it'll never have any other value. 
because uh, I do agree with the comment that was made earlier. It's not eco economically vi viable to go and undig a landfill right now and, and reuse that fuel. Someday it, it actually might be. Um, our facility can also extract uh, organics, which could be available for an anaerobic digestion plant at the top. So that's that top left icon, uh, which is a, a, a building, uh, which would fit on the product that Gus mentioned earlier. We then take that, that raw feedstock and send it to another partner, which is a company called Loesch, which is a German company, about 150 years old. They primarily make equipment to help uh, coal-fired power plants uh, grind their fuel up. Loesche takes our feedstock and turns it into a, an engineered pellet, which can be introduced into the pyrolysis reactor. But before it goes into the pyrolysis reactor, it is examined every six seconds at an atomic level with a prompt gamma neutron activation analyzer and dual gamma analyzer. So we have real-time information on everything that goes into our feedstock. That feedstock then hits the biorefinery, 1100 degrees centigrade. The only emissions that come out of our plant is water vapor. And we convert 100% of that uh, bone dry metric tons, 79,000 tons into diesel, biochar, or wood vinegar. A couple of other quick questions. I mentioned real time measurement. This is a very, very important point for us. We can't sell our diesel into markets where we're harvesting environmental attributes, credits for carbon reduction without proving fuel. It, there's, there's a lot of um, programs that actually also limit the amount of plastic that we want to put into fossil fuels, even in the renewables. So it's important to carbon sweep to limit as much as we can the plastics that go into our feedstock. But at the same time, those plastics are a good source of atomic molecules of hydrocarbons, which we can reconstitute and actually have very good thermal value. Um, so uh, we, we talk about, you know, the enemy of, 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 of uh, great is perfection or whatever was said earlier, you know, we participating in the transition is incremental, not, you know, an overnight uh, success story. Um, so we think that making progress in this regard is an important step. But we realize that we need to not only prove to you what we put in our fuel and what we take out of a lateralist trash, but the people um, that we sell our fuel to. So that's the kind of um, spectral analysis we will be doing on our fuel. And this can be done. To, um, the comments, so quickly, a couple of other pages. You know, this is your homepage of what you, you don't want in your recycling bins. You don't want film plastics. You don't want lids. You don't want food trays. Well, that's coming into the Let's do something with it. <laughs> this, 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 is, this is your recycling program. And, and, and I don't you know, uh, you know, I, I don't object to this, but it has the same challenges. You know, what's the best thing to do with this material? And, and finally, um, this is a, a great model, which is a carbon analysis, which is sanctioned by the Environmental Protection, the EPA. Um, so this is our carbon footprint. Uh, you know, we're gonna, you know, avoid a, a greenhouse gases, you know, from your baseline scenario. This is a sample. This is not the Alashua's project, but there are puts and takes. You know, where are we reducing carbon? Where are we adding carbon? The comment about running trucks around with uh, recyclables is a great one because it happens everywhere. Um, we do have some trucking in some of our examples, but the net effect for a carbon sweep project is we're going to take about 300,000 metric tons of emissions out of the atmosphere for one plant. And that's pretty significant. Um, the other thing I'll land back, back on is up at the top left, we also can offer, because this is a mixed material plant, lots of robotics, lots of other technology, you can take your recycling per single bin and we'll take all that material and still get recycling uh, rates out of it. Or you can keep your jewels. But uh, the advanced uh, technology that's in that uh, process, we could take all of the waste in, in one bin if you wanted to do that. I'm going to leave uh, my quick presentation there because I don't want to take too much time for everybody, but I that we qualify. Um, uh, Rich, I have another question. Um, let's let's assume that this this board was not opposed to learning and, and the comprehensive plan did not have that line in there. Okay, why would we want to go this direction 
you know, proving you to make a, a you know, a, a biofuel essentially out of this, as opposed to just uh, rising a company to, to, you know, just do a, you know, waste to e company to burn the plastic. I mean, what would be, what's the advantage? Yeah, sure. Well, well first of all, um, I, I'd like to say again, that I, I, I you know, worked for Covanta and, and, you know, I understand the, the waste to energy sector probably as well as anybody on, on this call. Uh, I'm, I'm an advocate of, of you as, a, as an energy source. Uh, I think that uh, the comments about, you know, the European Union and, and, and a lot of it, uh, techs that, that we uh, see overseas, you know, don't come here because, you know, landfills are cheap. Um, in this particular instance, the uh, carbon sweep disposal price will be less than you charge a landfill. Um, we're capitalizing the whole project and it'll cost probably less than $200 million to build an for 20 years and we'll have a lower carbon footprint traditional waste to energy plant a traditional waste to energy plant will probably cost somewhere around 700 million dollars your um you know your developer will probably want some participation from the municipality uh we're, we're coming in and, and saying we'll do this independently um you know if you want to stack the technologies carbon footprint side by side uh, cost or cost savings side by side um, and, and other metrics. I think that we could compete favorably, um, but, but, you know, you know, I'm an advocate for the waste energy sector. And, you know, there's more than one mousetrap in the world. Um, this happens to be my man now. So I hope you understand my, my advocacy there. And the other thing is, is in your numbers, do you calculate the, uh, the actual um, hydrocarbons that are going to come from burning the diesel fuel so, yeah, so ultimately burning the diesel fuel is a neutral because then we're not taking fossil fuel out of the ground. So, so your, your net carbon analysis, you know, comes down to, you know, avoided methane emissions at the landfill, the puts and the takes, energy to run the facility, you know, add backs, add ins. But ultimately, if we're not taking fossil diesel, which is fossil crude down, um, there's a net carbon benefit because we're not adding to the carbon inventory. How does the uh, combustion profile of biofuel compare with traditional uh, petroleum-based diesel? Yeah, uh, so um, it is cleaner. Um, our process, someone mentioned uh, chlorines and some other uh, chemical uh, co components. So our system deselects certain um, you know, um, elements and, and deselects it from the process. Uh, and one of the things that we have as part of the plant is the sulfurization island. So we make an ultra low sulfur diesel as part of our process. Um, so it burns cleaner uh, than most diesel fuels. Uh, there is such a thing as ultra low sulfur diesel already. Um, but I wanna also make one distinction. This is 100% renewable drop-in diesel gallon for gallon. Some people do confuse us with a biodiesel. A biodiesel is like the gas you buy at a gas station now where it can be up to 10% or 15% ethanol. Uh, and biodiesel by its definition is a blend. Renewable diesel is a completely separate product which is 100% gallon for gallon diesel. The emissions profile is better than most diesel that's uh, harvested. Um, again, we're ultra low sulfur diesel. Go ahead, Bettina. Yeah, so Rich, I have two questions. Um, with, with your proposal, do you generate any waste, like yes. hazardous waste? Oh, no, no, no hazardous waste, certainly no. And out of the, out of the, the, the proton power reactor, out of our pyrolysis, or the only emission is water vapor and the products we produce, which again are wood vinegar, char, biochar, and the fuel, um, there is a waste that goes to the landfill. Again, every ton of trash that comes in can be converted into a feedstock. And for example, I would use an example as uh, you know, maybe a, you know, someone breaks a glass or, or a rock gets into the, the, the waste stream. There are some materials that simply are not useful and, and those would get directed to a low. Uh, and, and we would, you know, uh, obviously direct that to a landfill. So we're not converting 100% of the waste into product. We're converting 100% of what is at a molecular level into 
a product. But so you don't generate any waste in the process. I'm not talking about the waste that you receive, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know, like you have to use materials, I'm sure, um, and there's no waste with those materials. There's no waste with the materials. We don't use a catalyst okay. in our reactor, and 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 uh, of the of the of the reduction of uh, the hundred thousand. If you look at that trend, um, the waste that comes into this process is about a hundred thousand tons of raw feed stuff. It then gets compressed and dried. There's a lot of moisture and waste. So you end up with about 80,000 metric tons of feedstock that's been dried and prepared, but there's no um, you know, literal waste that comes out of this process. Once we go from this process into the LOSHA uh, processing and, and feedstock conditioning and moisture re removal process, the only thing that comes out is fuel and water vapor. And what about at that LOSHA company? Do they generate waste? No, Losha is, 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 is they, they, they generate some water vapor when they remove water the vapor from our okay. process. So, so they basically dry the product, That's correct. I guess. Okay. And then my second question, would you also take plastics from the uh, life science labs? I've worked in a lot of laboratories and the amount of plastic we go through is, I mean, it's heartbreaking. <laughs> Well, and I, there have you know, been many attempts of recycling lab plastics, but so far, uh, you know, uh, no success. I, I would, uh, you know, there was a comment about, uh, you know, bottle and medical waste earlier, uh, which mm -hmm. exploded during the pandemic. And, you know, that's a great example of, you know, what's, what's the best for that? And I think that if we could take those materials and turn them into a useful product then that would make some sense you know however you know uh, we would have to you know obviously to some extent modify the definition of what Alachua you know considers to be a proper use of, of that material but we would certainly we would certainly take that feedstock mm -hmm. one of the problems using biomedical waste is that there's an enormous amount, uh, in, particularly in research labs, of microbial contaminants. Right. And uh, so what do you do to destroy my, microbes or um, There's so many uh, things that you have to factor in in trying yeah. to render that neutral enough to safely be used outside of a contained biomedical research lab. Yeah, just a, a quick a quick comment about that. So there's, you know, what, what is generally described in the medical waste sector as red bag pathogenic uh, waste. And then there's, you know, uh, regular, you know, saline bags and others which could very well have, you know, some biohazard, uh, you know, uh, conditions. Um, so what, what typically happens is that that material, which is not, you know, pathogenic surgical uh, waste body parts, um, what's, what's not in that category goes to um, an autoclave where it is, you know, conditioned and steamed, for example, and all the pathogens are cleaned. And then you end up with a pile of a clean plastic waste, which pretty much goes to a landfill right now. That's um, true. So there are, you know, separating that waste stream and handling it properly is certainly an opportunity, but you definitely would have an interim step from a, from a biohazard perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's also plenty of labs that don't deal with medical waste, like, you know, biology labs or whatever, botany labs, right. and tons of labs. Yeah. Thanks, Bettina. Go ahead, Scott. Um, Linda can go first. I've already spoken a bit on this, but I'll follow her. Okay. Go ahead, Linda. Thank you. I might take us in a little different direction. I, was, I have a question about um, the economic development piece of the project and um, job creation. Um, looking across the three proposals, it seems like Carbon Sweep had the largest number of you know jobs that would be created. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Um, I think it was almost at least 50% more jobs. So I'd like to see why um, Carbon Sweep um, anticipates that many hires. I, I, I won't. I can't really compare myself to the other programs. Well, first of all, um, Florida Express 
disposal for you know transfer station and, and sortation facility not all communities should have that type of infrastructure but it's sort of apple proposing um, I'm sure the waste away folks will, will talk about their in this particular instance we have you know a significant amount of construction jobs and about 100 um, in the mixed material processing facility that's typically employees that come to work on multiple shifts to help uh, you know run that you know even with automation and robots and a lot of other uh, you know, a labor intensive process managing waste, as I'm sure Gus could attest to. And then you have a, a buyer who will certainly have a, a significant amount of folks moving material, eating feedstock, um, you know, and, and then there'll be a very significant plug of, of senior people that will run these operations because this is not a um, small, uh, you know, uh, platform here. This is a highly technical installation. There'll be a lot of very good high -end jobs. And uh, so we estimate somewhere around 100 permits created uh, in the community, and so it's a significant portion of those, would, uh, well, you know, all well-paying jobs, I think, but a significant slot of them, uh, senior uh, people. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, so I, I actually <laughs> like glad Linda went first because I think that was a very good point. I I kind of look at this, and I have not reviewed the proposal. Um, obviously, to the extent that uh, Lashua County staff did, but this seems likely the kind of project we potentially don't want to eliminate. <laughs> We're they're using a feedstock that is really not being recycled in the community, can't be recycled, and is built. It's realistically, wholly. Um, Hopefully this technology isn't necessary 20 years in the future. We'll move on and the company will start doing something different, but the plastics are no longer available to feed this. This is a company that will evolve or will cease to exist. And the fact essentially these biodiesels are being sold into the EU, which is substantially more emphasis on meeting long-term climate change goals is an indication that we shouldn't really be removing companies from. I mean, the, what what will happen? will move right across the county boundary into another county and create those jobs there, and I think that's a loss. So I tend to agree with Scott on this, and I think that this action that we had set as the requirement is not waste energy burning, it's conversion we already use. And when we stop using diesel, we'll stop, they'll, they'll be out of business by then too. So, but yeah, I think the fact that this, I consider this more of a reuse. The products that aren't gonna be reused any other way and we'll go into, continue to go into uh, landfill. So I think it should be reconsidered on that grounds and that's what I intend to, to go to the county commission saying. Um, why don't we go ahead and move on? Um, I want to make sure uh, um, do their presentations. So um, since we're on the uh, plastics um, and, and using them as part of the process, why don't we um, move on to waste away? Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm Charles Mosley. I'm a representative of waste and uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our company and our proposal. Uh, our company, uh, we began as a uh, automated nursery, one of the five largest automated equipment manufacturers for nursery. We have over 5,000 customers worldwide. <clears throat> Excuse me, talk to you. Uh, our uh, wasteway technology was uh, designed and implemented in a particular process with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, we actually have plants today. We're currently in the front end engineering and design work in Kern County, California, uh, that would actually be very similar 
for, uh, for Latchford County. Our proposal actually gave a couple of different scenarios. One, where we would take our uh, fuel and uh, put it in to produce gas, which could be used to replace gas at uh, uh, GRU or put in the pipelines, pipeline quality gas. And that way, we would actually not use any of the plastics. The plastics would come out of the system and it would be landfill. But the best proposal we feel like for Latchford County is at producing our sterile pathogen free fuel. We went through a five year process with the U.S. The EPA classified us as a secondary non hazardous fuel. Uh, it replaces uh, other uh, uh, fossil fuels. It was done by Latchford County and uh, it's completed in March. It says that uh, your largest uh, greenhouse gas is Argo cement. Uh, Argo cement uh, emits almost 900 tons a year of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we've tested our fuel with Argo cement. I hear from them every couple of weeks. They want to buy our plant there in uh, Latchwood County from somewhere. Uh, the of our fuel used at Arco Cement is their greenhouse gas emissions by 1.7 tons. Sweet zero coming out of the uh, Argo Cement plant. Uh, uh, it'll cost between 35 and $40 million for the county. We'll employ 25 to 30 people and we for fewer people uh, than maybe some of the other industries because our system is automated. They're skilled people. Uh, we'll have uh, electricians in our system. Um, so, uh, you know, plants that you can see. In fact, we've had visitors from your county now. Users in your county that will lower the greenhouse gas. It's not around the world right there. And we can remove with our automated system almost all the plastics. If you want to, it'll reduce our BTU value slightly. But we can't guarantee it was out of the solid fuel. It's just not possible today. If uh, uh, we can remove all the plastics, uh, then we can certainly do that. Uh, technology are on that, I think, guarantees about 90% reduction in plastics, but there'll still be some pieces. Again, there's just no way we can do that unless we go with the, the uh, anaerobic diet and the plastics can all be removed. So our proposal actually, uh, we propose to you and work on the best system for Alachua County because we have different models that will work. In one, with anaerobic digester, we still make our solid fuel, but all of the solid fuel to create gas, it is pipeline quality gas and uh, it's considered green and renewable. And uh, so whether GRU is on the pipeline, that's uh, either is, uh, is possible. And uh, I honestly believe that Argos wants to be a better neighbor than they than have better fuels and they're currently using the fossil fuels. So extensively two of their plants using our fuel and uh, Again, they love it and it meets the purpose that they seek, which is to lower greenhouse gases. Um, I'm open for questions, uh, anything that you might have. Thank you, Charles. Do we have yes. a question? Um, I, I have three questions. We take uh, whatever's left used, uh, our single stream garbage, however you want, whether it's coming out of the earth where you've already recycled a lot of the materials or not. The fuel comes in, the end of our facility is an automated MRF. What uh, is a MRF? The, uh, What's a me? MRF? It's a, uh, forgive me for say, not saying that, it's a material recycling facility. So the material, the garbage comes in, it 
put a front shredder that's there basically to open the black bags uh, with an automated metals, the ferrous and non-ferrous, the steel, the aluminum, the copper, any, any metals that fill in the waste stream are removed and recycled. Uh, it goes through a second, it'll go through a process to remove the plastics, if that's what uh, Alachua County would like. The that are possible to remove, which is about 90% of the plastic waste to a landfill. We go through a separate process that removes the inner box to glass. Those are materials that have no BTU value, whether you're making liquid or so about 10% of what comes in goes to a landfill. Cardboard, textiles, green waste, and so uh, that goes through a process that uh, does a second shred, and then it goes in a patented automated hydrolyzer. It's a sterilization process. At 350 uh, uh, degrees, 100 degrees. And uh, when the material goes into the autoclave, uh, it's like ground up garbage. When it comes out, it has changed its uh, taste more like the old gray, gray attic insulation material that you we used to blow our attic. And uh, that material is sterile. Uh, it is in hand. And you can uh, pelletize it. You can sit it in a in a pile of pellets. Unlike a wood pellet, it doesn't change. So that gives industry a, a, a better opportunity where a wood pellet does not, because we killed all the bad actors with our hydrolyzer, uh, our autoclave, you might say. So uh, once the material comes out, uh, it's uh, it's sold. We actually are. Uh, currently working to make buildings out of our material. If you go to our website, you can see some of the building products that we, uh, we can make park benches, uh, garbage cans, all sorts of material. California is going to add a system. They'll use part of their, uh, their, their SC is what we call the product. They're going to use the SC3 to actually make for, uh, uh, for homeless and uh, a lot of different uses for our product. And uh, again, I will sit down and show you all the possibilities Waste Away could provide you. And I think we got scored low because our, our main point was let's lower the greenhouse gases in the, in the county or the cement. And uh, to lower greenhouse gases in your county, there can't be a better use to support them. And, uh, but we have a host of different opportunities. The building products for uh, Kern County uh, in the state, that's part of the front end engineering design work we're doing. For so there's a host of products that can actually be made from our SC3. I just have a quick follow up question because you were talking digester uh, to make your gas but and not digest plastics, right? Plastics would be, they would come out and they would be landfill. Okay. You. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, Charles, you're, so you're talking about supplying essentially, I realize it's not natural gas, but essentially that's what you're, you're providing them as a, a gaseous burnable uh, product. It has the same characteristics, uh, same chemistry. Uh, it does have to have uh, a little cleaning to make it pipeline quality. Uh, are you, uh, are you uh, called here tonight? I don't know if you'd like to discuss that with him, but uh, they could certainly uh, use our gas at their facility to replace what they're currently buying. And what, what, what are the emissions of your plant? What would they be? Our plant only uses a very small amount of electricity and a small amount of natural gas. We use natural gas for our uh, hydrolyzer and for our drying process. When you uh, 
different from uh, a wood pellet. Uh, our moisture in our fuel is a surface moisture. So it takes a very small amount to, uh, to dry the fuel uh, to make it uh, useful for Argos. We've tried to dry the fuel to about 10% uh, moisture or less. Now, if we went into an anaerobic digester, we wouldn't dry it at all. We would take it right out of the hydrolyzer without drying it right into anaerobic digestion. It sounds like you, you're producing more than one product. You're producing a pellet and you're producing a gas, correct? Well, not necessarily. We just have more options. So it's up to you to choose the best option for, for a account. If it's fuel for Argos, we can do that. We can take 100% of the fuel into anaerobic digestion. Uh, we can take a percentage of the fuel in the, in the building products. But I will say that the building products aren't completely ready for the U.S. market at this stage. We have more testing to do. Uh, that's a pretty uh, a fairly new uh, concept that we've used. And we do have building products. If you go to our website, you'll see it. As a matter of fact, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers actually ballistic tested some of our stuff. So uh, we've had the extensive testing of the building products. And if you could take garbage and make housing, uh, I think that is a, a great future use for, uh, for our product. Thank you. Well. Charles, just um, you, you mentioned when you clean the, when you go through the process of cleaning the waste, you, you remove the plastic and you said there was like a percentage, I think that, that you couldn't remove. What was that number again? Right. And, and typically in, in some markets, for instance, Kern County, the fuel is going to two cement kilns there, Kern County, California. We're, we don't intend to remove the plastics there, but our system is designed where if that's what you choose based on your regulations or your uses, we can remove up to 90% of the plastics. But there's always going to be a small amount that gets through in any process. There are just some that you can't get out of the system. So uh, if we were making the fuel for uh, Argos, there would be a small amount of plastics that, uh, that go into the fuel that they would burn. We don't burn our own fuel, it goes to other users, but we just can't guarantee that we can remove it all. Is there a reason why you don't burn your own fuel as opposed to you know, getting it from GRU or some outside source? Well, to be real honest with you, uh, we can buy natural gas much cheaper than burning our own fuel. Uh, our own fuel is perfect for a uh, company like Argos, any cement kiln, a power plant, because uh, if they use our fuel as a replacement for uh, the uh, current fuels in use, current fossil fuels, then we lower their greenhouse gas standards. And that's what they're all trying to do. That? Argos is so, willing to do that? Argos is willing to do that considering that your product will cost them more? They are. We already have a signed LOI with them. They'll, they'll uh, purchase up to 100,000 tons a year. And there's cement kilns all over Florida. We've tested with most of them. And uh, there's a ready use for our fuel all over the state. Well, I'm Some curious what their logic is for doing that. I mean, as a business, you'd think they would want to just, you know, take the cheapest product they could get by with them. So, you know. Well, with the, today's uh, fuel cost, and particularly in Florida, there's no coal being generated in Florida, so they have to uh, rail it in a long way. So that's another big carbon uh, footprint, another good, uh, a big carbon cost in the area. So, uh, you know, they don't have that many options in Florida. Uh, so they do have natural gas, but again, according to the EPA uh, and how they've structured and based our fuel, classified our fuel, then uh, we, save them 1.7 tons of greenhouse gas emissions for every ton of our fuel that they use as a replacement for their existing fossil fuels. So, um, you know, in actuality for them, our fuel costs uh, less than purchasing fossil fuels because they can also sell uh, carbon credits for the use of our fuel. So once they sell those carbon credits, then our fuel is probably less expensive than the fossil fuels they're currently using. Okay, yeah, that, 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 that gives me at least one answer on that because I don't see what, you know, they're allowed to admit pretty much what they, what they want to. I mean, there's a calculation made for every type of pollution that they make and they're well within the pollution for already for greenhouse gases, even though it's just gigantic. So I was, I was curious why they would take, I was curious why they would 
you know, take a product that will cost them more than what they're currently using. But now you answered that because if they can sell the greenhouse, uh, you know, uh, credits, then, you know, they're, they, you know, they, they would probably be able to cut their expenses in that way. So that answers that. And, and David, if you look at one other thing, most of these companies are foreign owned now. Um, so uh, CMEX, I mean, Argos, uh, most of the large cement kilns are foreign owned and the rest of the world's just ahead of us. And they have, uh, corporate mandates that come down and say you will use a certain amount of renewable fuel at your plant. And if you look at Argos, they've added an alternative feed system at the cost of millions of dollars in the hopes of finding a fuel like ours. Now you you don't need to have plastic to make your product. Is that correct? When it really comes we down do to not. It? Okay. That's correct. We do not. Okay. So Charles, if you uh, have all this plastic that you're able to separate uh, from the stream, can you provide it to companies that can utilize it to, let's say, uh, convert to a new material that's usable? Uh, some of it, but there's always part of it that's going to be landfill. Unless you unless you burn it, part of it will always be landfill. Mm. Uh, there are uses. Some of it is just today. Some of it is just not useful. Okay, thank you, Charles. Um, oh, you're welcome. Why don't we go Misha, ahead? Can yeah. I just say one thing really quickly? For sure. Um, I just wanted to say between carbon sweep and the, this presentation, it seems like we can now potentially get rid of plastics and everything that's non-mineral that is non-plastics which seems like a great scenario to substantially reduce our, reduce our landfill footprint. And I think we're about to hear about how to get rid of a lot of the uh, construction and demolition debris, which are things that are less breakdownable. Um, but it, it feels a little bit like the three of these may be somewhat holistic if you were to look at them together. Yeah. Um... Sounds like it too. I think, did, Gus, did you mention that there's only room for two of them? So I will have to sit down, assuming the board wants to move into this direction, I will have to sit down with Waste Away and um, Carbon Sweep because they will be looking to use the same uh, raw material, which is the garbage generating in Alachua County. So I don't think there's room for both of them. I may be wrong, but I think there's room for both of them uh, here in the county. Gotcha. Okay. Um, why don't we go ahead and move on to Florida Express Environmental? I think you've presented Hello, this before is Marcy for us. Can you hear me? Hi, Marcy. Hi. I am having technical difficulties. Uh, I can't get either my camera or microphone to work tonight, which is why I am phoning in. Um, nope, no problem. We appreciate you phoning in. I, I'm sorry about that, but I, I'm going to be very brief. Um, some of you have heard my presentation before. Um, I represent Florida Express Environmental, which is a family-owned business with 45 years of experience in the waste hauling and recycling industry. They're based in Ocala. Currently, construction and demolition waste is a significant component of the waste stream in Alachua County, and it is not currently being addressed, meaning it all, almost all goes to landfills. By construction and demolition debris, I mean things like wood, concrete, brick, metal, cardboard, asphalt. My client wishes to build a state-of-the-art demolition transfer station slash recycling facility that would address a significant amount of the, the construction and demolition debris that is currently being landfilled. Um, the proposed facility is 40,000 square feet. My clients are uh, going to capitalize that themselves. They're ready to invest $5 million. Florida Express Environmental already has relationships with paper mills and steel mills steel mills, that's hard to say, and other end users of recyclables that will 
enable their facility to significantly minimize the amount of construction and demolition debris that is not currently being reused. Uh, this facility will employ at least 12 people with a variety of skill levels, and the facility is designed to be scalable, which means that as technology improves, the uh, facility can be added onto to capture more of the materials that are currently being uh, landfilled. Um, we feel that this facility is going to make a huge leap forward for Alachua County in, in achieving its goal of zero waste. We're excited to have been uh, ranked so highly by Alachua County staff, and we're looking forward to, to working with staff to uh, negotiate the final detail. And if you have any questions, I am happy to try and address them. I have a question for Gus. Gus, where, where are the uh, currently being handled? Right now, we have two CND facilities, either to Florence or to Watson, which is technically not at Latcher County, but it's right at the county line. Okay, thank you. Uh, and a lot of it is also handled offsite, it's just somewhere else. Are there any emissions from this, um, from this facility that we should know about, Marcy? No, no emissions whatsoever. Hey, Marty, you said they want to build a transfer station and also recycling facility. So transfer, what do they mean by that? Well, not everything in the waste C and D waste stream can be recycled. So what can't be recycled would be transferred to Levita Brown. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Can Levita Brown handle that, Gus? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Marcy. Any other questions? I know you've presented um, for us before, so I think a lot of our board um, have probably already asked you some of your um, questions. I, Go ahead, Scott. Sorry, Nisha. You, you know I had to speak on one. So um, I, I would say that this, <clears throat> I'm not, a, I, I, I think all the proposals have merit. This one I find, maybe least interesting from the standpoint of C and D is pretty inert <clears throat> by comparison to most of the other wastes that have been discussed. And it's kind of dealing with the easiest to deal with piece. That doesn't mean that I don't think it has a place and it fits. <clears throat> As Gus said, maybe it's two of these that fit best, but recycling steel and paper I would like to think we could do better. <laughs> um, if we're really shooting for innovation, recycling, you know, an eco loop idea feels like it should be a bit more innovative and cutting edge. So not that this one shouldn't move forward, but I would like to think we incorporate something a bit more innovative and cutting edge than we're going to recycle metal and paper. Like what? There's space for all three, aren't there? Isn't there, Gus? Excuse me? There is actual physical space for all three. I understand there's a whole other piece of property adjacent to the, where we're planning on building here. I don't think there's physical space for three of them, but you're right. We do have additional property that we could use. But like I said before, I think Waste Away and Carbon Suite will be competing for the same resources. I agree it looks that way, but if, if, if uh, um, Waste Away is only going to be using 10% of the plastic uh, you know, the waste that we have. I'm just, I'm just, it would be a matter of sitting down with both of those companies at the same time and saying, okay, what can we work out? You know, I mean, is it possible for both of these companies to work in, you know, with the same waste stream? It sounds like it is because, you know, the, the one uses the primary of the plastic and the other doesn't, I believe. I mean, that's, that's what I heard. Is that wrong? Rich maybe can comment on that best. I, I think it's, I think it's, it's respond to this real quick. I think it's probably fair ahead, to say Rich. Charles and I would, would agree. It's probably the same waste stream primarily. Uh, and, and if you, you start you know, parsing out a certain amount of plastic that one could tolerate more or less, 
I think we're still both chasing the same fundamental proposal, which is take your MSW and turn it into a better product. So, uh, you know, I think that's a, more of a head to head comparison. Uh, I, you know, that, that Charles, I'll, I'll give you the floor. Thank you, Rich. I have to agree with Rick. Uh, we are both looking for the same waste stream. Uh, we can use the plastics uh, in our fuel uh, to, to answer David's question. The, uh, the reason that we uh, suggested that it be removed is because of your current uh, uh, regulations that are on the books. So, but uh, Argos would prefer that the, the plastics be left in the fuel, but that's going to be an Alachua County decision. Okay, thank you. I, I mean, the one other just comment here is I heard essentially a seven and eight and a nine figure number presented. And it seems like the one that was selected is the smallest investment in the community and likely the smallest number of jobs, um, <clears throat> which does present some concerns also. I don't see where CND is. The CND project is is at all in a conflict with either one of these other projects. I think the question is is whether uh, either one or you know either one of these projects uh, we'd have to evaluate them both and see if is, are they truly um, out of sync with what we want to do with that property one uh, and two you know is one fit is one a better fit than the other since they both use the same waste stream we'd have to choose just one. So I think that's really the question is you know. It's a dual question, of course, but I think that's really what the question is. Um, actually, if I may, for staff, the question is whether these two projects are in compliance with the comprehensive plan requirements. Mm -hmm. So when, when we look at that language, we take a very, very conservative approach. We don't try to read up what we think the commissioners may be thinking. I mean, we just go by the letter of it. And based on that, we don't think they do. That being said, you know, they can have more flexibility that we can. They are their commissioners. It's their job to make those decisions. So if EPAC feels that one or both of these projects meet the comprehensive plan as is, or maybe they meet it if uh, there's a little bit more leeway on the definitions within the comprehensive plan, or even if they, you feel that the comprehensive plan needs to be changed, I mean, that's the kind of input that I need from EPAC so I can take back to the board. And I understand that you cannot take a formal vote because this is a workshop, but you know, I guess you, you guys can talk about it and I can, by consensus, kind of figure out what you guys want. Also, you're free to contact the commissioners directly. Uh, the other thing that I will mention is, at this point, we are in the, in the landlord mode. We're just looking to lease a piece of property for a company to sit there and do business. So that's the only drawback from the waste away approach. They came up with a concept plan, which I understand, but that's not what we're looking at right now. So if we wanted to sit down and evaluate the pros and cons of carbon sweep and waste away, assuming the board agrees with the, whether they meet or don't meet the comprehensive plan, then we will need something a lot more specific and defined from waste away. Well, Gus, there are two things. First of all, I, I'd like to, I'd like to have a little deeper dive into into uh, uh, carbon sweep and see what you know what's all what all their proposal is. I mean, I you know obviously I only have what was presented to me tonight uh, to go on, and I'd like to know more. But it sounds to me like we should be getting the commission to you know to consider this. And um, to be honest, the wording that's in the comprehensive plan, I was there the day that wording was put in, and it was I had I had a lot of making sure that it got put in the way it did get put in. Okay, so. I can. I'm certain. If you go back and look at your, you know, look at the, the whatever notes were taken from that day by the, the, the county secretary, I'm sure that's what you'll see. Um, so I would like to actually go back and, and see if we couldn't find a way to modify that to the degree that I'm still totally against waste energy, but I consider this, even though there's some heat, you know, applied, if you will, um, through their pyrolysis, tech, uh, you know, technique. I think that this still falls in the category of being a recycling facility to recycle plastic into something else that's usable. And although that product has an element of being burned to it, you know, we're going to be using um, a diesel for a while. Um, and, you know, until we stop using um, oil products altogether, we're going to, you know, we're going to be burning some diesel and some gasoline. And 
And we're going to be, you know, but we can stop the use of plastic somewhere down the line. That's something we can do. And I don't think this would inhibit us from stopping that, um, you know, the use of plastic. It's not the same thing as, again, burning it all. Where it goes away as a problem altogether. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of for this idea. I say sort of because I haven't seen the total <laughs> proposal and haven't made that, you know, that deep dive and the deeper thinking that that will take. Uh, like I said, what I'm planning to bring to the board on August 9 is going to be three independent recommendations, the one that staff did, and we're basically, you know, doing a recommendation based on the current language. So yes. we got to follow that. EPAC can have their own set of recommendations. They don't have to follow along with what we're saying. And EDAC is going to have their own based on the way they look at things. Uh, so if, like I say, and I'm not sure, maybe Mark has a better idea of how to convey EPAC's wishes without actually having a vote because you cannot vote, it's my understanding. We can get together and vote if we think it's important enough and we could get together, uh, make a proposal to modify the, uh, the comp plan in a set way um, and see if that's, you know, if that would be acceptable to the commission. Yeah, we could um, schedule like the next month's meeting to be in person and then we could take a formal vote on something. So, um, so to that point, because I was afraid you were gonna say that, <laughs> So the, the way the county process works for, for in order for me to meet my deadlines, I have to be done with the package two weeks before the meeting. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you were to meet, you know, the first Tuesday it would certainly be before the board meeting on August 9, but it would be too late for me to put it in the package. That doesn't mean the chair cannot show up at the meeting and present a letter or whatever you, you want to do. Gotcha. Well, perhaps you want to, you want to revise whatever you've got so that you can you know put something in, you know, so to speak, late and get that you know still be able to get approval. Maybe maybe there's a way to do that. No. Yeah, uh, we've done that in the past. Uh, the commissioners frown upon that. <laughs> I don't understand that. I mean, we could, um, as individual members of EPAC, email Mark if we were so inclined um, with our takeaway from this meeting. Um, on an individual basis, I mean, it's less less impactful than us all coming to a consensus, but that's another option. Yeah, and, and I certainly understand that, I mean, most of you, if not all of you, haven't had a chance to actually read the proposals. Uh, so, I mean, I'm not saying you, I need something tonight, uh, but, you know, the sooner the better, basically. Sure. Um, go. I, I want to get to Bettina and Scott, because I know, Bettina, you've had your hand up for a little while. <laughs> So, yes, and my questions keep piling up. <laughs> so, so let me just very quickly comment because I think this is important. So I do think it would be nice if EPAC, if the group meets and discusses this rather than everybody sending their individual comments. I think this is really important. And uh, I think this is a really, good opportunity for EPAC to work as a group and, you know, to make some sense of these proposals. And then also I want to, um, coming back to Marcy's presentation, I just wanted to know how big is the volume of, of the construction debris material per, I don't know, year or per month or whatever. How, how much does that impact Alachua County? I don't know the answer to that question, but I will find out for you. Okay, thank you. And then my, my last thought, um, rather than modifying the comprehensive plan, could those two companies that want to target our waste to generate um, fuel, could they modify the language in their proposals to meet the comprehensive plan? Is that possible? I personally don't believe they can because they're going to be using, like they said, there's no way for them to 100% remove all the plastic. They can minimize the amount that's there. But if you, take a, if you take a very conservative approach, you know, no plastic is zero. And that's not something that's okay. achievable right now. Okay. Yeah, I mean, respectfully for the committee, you know, our, our distinction that we're trying to make is that, you know, we're you know, deconstructing 
plastic into something that's no longer plastic and then reconstructing something into a fuel. So, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's being used as a feedstock, not a fuel, but that's, those are semantics, right? And, and we, I appreciate the committee's willingness to listen to that. And, um, you know, these are all, it's the kind of shades of gray in these processes where you're, you know, putting a proposal together and Gus, I, I completely understand what you're saying. I mean, that, that's a part of a process and, we hope we we hope we didn't we hope we didn't miss the boat because of a definition. Uh, I guess that's the uh, that's the sentiment I want to I want to share. And if I may, on the on the missing the boat, I mean, we're certain. I mean, we want to make the whole property available for development. So just because there's not they don't make this first cut, I mean, there's going to be a second bite and a third bite until we fill the property. Yeah. So it doesn't have to happen to happen on this particular one. So. So that's the good thing that we're going to go back and put the rest of the site up for lease. And that may give the board the, enough time to discuss this particular issue. Uh, the other thing is, I just check your schedule. And I think your next meeting will be August the, the 2nd. Sounds right. So if you were to meet there and come up with a letter and a vote, yeah, I probably can sneak it in in, in the agenda, even though it's past the deadline. But we could meet before that. I mean, we've been meeting uh, intermittently for the community conversations for a long time. So I think this actually would be really important. So we could meet, let's say, in two weeks or whatever. Yeah, if enough people are on board with that, um, we can set up a subcommittee meeting. Um, go ahead, Scott. Um, I. I would agree that I think it's worth setting up a subcommittee meeting. I would really like to see us discuss as part of that, this waste to energy exclusion altogether. I think it's a bad policy. If we actually want to achieve zero waste, we have to come up with a solution for plastics, which we don't have. And right now, this is the best option. I'm not saying it's the perfect option, it's the best. Um, so our other choice is filling up a landfill in an impoverished, relatively impoverished county that is not Alachua County, which feels morally wrong if there is an option that keeps this waste from ending up there. Um, I mean, we ship all of our garbage out of the county. It's literally nimbyism to an extreme. Um, I think having this eco loop set up, first off, I think having it actually with companies there is a, is a really positive thing. I would much rather see two companies go in now, um, have Marcy's, the, the company she's representing, deal with C&D de debris, which is, the thing about C&D debris is it's extremely heavy and it's a substantial portion of the waste stream. Um, the MSW piece is also a very large portion, but I would rather see something done with that than what's currently happening, which is it's being loaded in trucks and driven using diesel, most likely, up to a landfill where it's then being placed in the ground so that our children will someday be able to play on a mound of garbage. Um, it really does not feel like the best solution. And... I'm going to have to breathe the air uh, for a very long time, and I would much rather see this burned than filling up uh, natural areas of the world. I'm not concerned about the technology to be able to burn it safely. I think it is completely feasible, and I think the county could adopt a standard that's very stringent, maybe something more in line with the EU for waste to energy facilities, um, and allow projects like this that honestly aren't even exactly waste to energy. Yeah, Scott, the one, the one point we disagree on is, you know, I think there is value in maintaining, a, you know, a, a, a requirement that we don't just plain burn it, you know, because of the fact that that's going to encourage people to continue using plastic, even increase the amount of plastic they use. On the other hand, um, you know, there, you know, I think that at least CS, in my mind, promotes the, they both actually do uh, promote the idea of using the, uh, um, the plastic, among other things in the waste stream for creating a, a product. And that involves, to me, that's, that's a re, you know, reuse of plastic rather than a waste of energy burning it. So I think it's important to make that difference because 
um, you know, if we say, okay, you can you can put together new technology that that you know finds a way to recycle plastics, and um, it's a much better way ultimately of going about it than it is to uh, to just burn it. Um, there may be no you know no end in sight you know of getting rid of plastics, and and we can take a look at burning you know at some later point. But I think at this point in time, we we're going to have enough pushback from other organizations, other stakeholders in this, that it still may not be something that the board is going to want to pass just for that reason alone. But I think that we can promote the idea of the conversion you know, of the plastics into something else. So where I, where I take, where, where I don't really accept that, I guess, response is it is recycling it into energy. So it is technically recycling. The other thing is the county now relies on a biomass facility that literally is fed by timber that is cut down using diesel equipment, transported using diesel equipment to a facility that then is a waste to energy facility, essentially. It is taking timber, which as soon as it's cut down becomes a waste product if it's not turned into something else and burning it. Like, I don't see how cutting down forests to generate energy is in any way better than burning garbage, which is it's literally good, going to go good. in a hole in the ground. Yeah, I can't argue with that uh, point. I, I just don't have, I don't have anything that I could possibly make that argument with because I'm with you hundred percent when it comes to the- so, so, but I mean, right there is a perfect example. We are, we're taking a very arbitrary position. If, if it was like the process is hundred percent clean, generates no emissions, it seems like we should be in favor of something like that. And it, we're essentially making it impossible to even consider projects that could be phenomenal just because of an arbitrary definition of waste to energy with plastics. That's I'm willing I mean, to consider. It, I'm willing to consider, Scott. The, the okay. thing is, right now, it can't be considered because of a rule that's on the books. Right, but I'm willing to. I'm willing if to the rule wasn't on the books. Right, so, but I'm willing to work against uh, to work for modifying that rule. Okay, and I, you know, I I know that can be done because you know there were there were commissioners who had questions of whether that rule was too strict or not. My my concern basically is I want to make sure that we've gotten a point where the technology that is used to do any kind of uh, conversion or burning, uh, you know, whatever is used, whatever is done with the plastic, is sufficient to guarantee that we're not producing, you know, new 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 uh, pollutions going into the air. That's one of the things my my primary concern is. I also don't want to violate this concept of, you know, we need to get rid of using. Uh, and this is an important point, by the way. I think you are completely missing it, and I may be missing your point. But uh, the point is that you know, as long as we're using fossil fuels and creating plastic, you know, from them, um, you know, we're going to have a problem. We need to stop creating plastics. Now we're going to be using fossil fuels for a while, but it doesn't mean we have to continue create, creating plastics. And plastics are just a huge problem, and we're not going to get rid of them all by just burning them. We just need to stop using them all together. And that's the better solution. It's like in pollution, what's better after the fact, finding a way to clear out most of the pollution or just not putting it into the water in the first place. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's not something that we can just, you know, we can just say, here's, here's what we want to do overnight. We, we really have to talk about this a lot more. We do. And so I'm all for having, having subcommittee meetings and, and even perhaps future meetings where this is our sole subject. We discuss this. Sure. On that note, um, do we want to go ahead and set up an, a date to meet um, in a couple of weeks? Mark, is, is, is two weeks a sufficient amount of time for you to set something up? It would have to be in person, too, because presumably we'd want to potentially get a letter um, for Gus. Um, um, Gus, what time frame do you need also? I think that's an important question here. So, like I said, the I'm hoping to get this thing to the commissioners on August 9. So, using the current deadlines, that would be two weeks before August 9. But, you know, if you're going to meet on August the 2nd, take a vote, draft a letter, give it to me the following day, I can certainly find a way to put it in the agenda package. Okay, so why don't, why don't we, since... A lot of people are um, pretty interested in this um, and being proactive. And I think that if we 
if we slated it for next meeting, um, it, it we would potentially run the risk of having that be the whole meeting, um, or at least a, a substantial part of it. Um, why don't we go ahead and set up a subcommittee meeting so we can talk about this a little more? Um, and maybe by that time, we'll have a letter. Um, we'll have a consensus enough to have a letter um, that we can start preparing. And, and if not, um, we can finalize everything on, on the second and get you something um, no later than like August 3rd. So, so we're going to schedule a meeting in a couple of weeks, let's say, which would be a subcommittee meeting and it can be a Zoom meeting. And then on August 2nd, we'll have our regular meeting, but that'll be an in-person meeting. Okay, that works. Okay, good. Either that or, I mean, <laughs> even on whether it's the 13th or the 2nd, I mean, you don't have to meet for more than five minutes. I mean, to sign. I mean, we could, you could have a meeting, and I agree with what they're saying, is like, for any reason, just to get a quorum and to make sure that as many people can attend as possible to have Zoom meeting preferable. And then we just have enough people show up for a quorum to sign it. And, you know, you do that in the parking lot, you know, in five minutes and be done with it. So I think that probably would be the best use of everybody's time, you know, to towards that, as opposed to potentially sitting in a room with, you know, particularly somebody's, um, you know, I mean, I'm in quarantine right now. So, I mean, I, the amount of people we know that it's just like rampant. So I think we just kind of like, you can be the amount of time we need in terms of just physically being together should be limited, but, um, but as far as, you know, I can, as far as your question, I have to have two weeks. So I, I could submit a request tomorrow to, to meet on the 13th or anytime after that. Uh, and at a time that y'all, I mean, six o'clock, whenever time y'all would prefer, five o'clock, doesn't matter to me. But then um, in the meantime, if you wanted to, you know, I agree, just review the proposals and maybe draft a letter of, you know, where your preference would be so that um, you kind of look at it from that standpoint, something that can be reviewed on the 13th would probably be that way you're, you're minimizing the amount of time um, in terms of- Mark, if you need two weeks, wouldn't it be the 20th or? Sorry. Uh, yeah, you're right. My bad. It's um, the 20th. Yeah. So, and Mark, can can either you or Gus uh, send us the, a a you know a reference to the exact part of the uh, comp plan where this is covered, and then probably what should happen there is maybe both Scott and I can can look at that language and see how we want to modify it because we're likely to come up with two completely different recommendations, and then we can discuss those at our next meeting. David, one of the documents you should have received was the request for proposals. Um, template. So mm -hmm. within the, that document, there's a specific reference to that policy. Does it say where it is in, in, the, in the plan? Oh, but I, I can send you a, 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 a list. I mean, I got the link. Okay, because that's what I was looking for. Plus, I know there's a number of locations that we, you know, recommended be changed yes. at that time. Yes. So, I, you know, we need all of those. We need all those references so that we can recommend here is a change that needs to be made to the comp plan and here's all the places where it needs to be made. Okay. And mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't get that from the, the bit of the proposal that I read. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> correct. The, the language is the same, but it's in several places in the comprehensive plan. Yep. Can you send that link to all of us? I'll send it to Mark and then Mark will do his thing. Yep. Okay. Right. And um, Mark, just on, on your um, note about meeting in person. So what would, to have a discussion about this and then meet for a quorum, um, would, would we do something like schedule a Zoom meeting on, on Wednesday um, and then schedule an in-person meeting the following day, for example, where enough of us come into a parking lot and say, like, let's, yes. That's fine. Is that, okay. Yeah. <laughs> kind of funny but yeah i, I mean, don't like that idea but this is bonnie uh, burgess from the city of alachua and i haven't had an opportunity to introduce myself i missed the introduction so i apologize for that um but i would like to just say for me personally uh in person because i don't seem to be able to, we won't seem to be able to get a word in edgewise especially us newbies and i have a lot this is a lot to digest pun intended okay or not digest let's put it that way so and i and and i am so glad that i'm sitting on the board with experts so being a good listener as a counselor is paying off 
when it comes to this. But I wanted to get the opportunity, if I may, um, to, to ask uh, Gus a question um, about the, uh, I was reading the, uh, I guess it's the comprehensive plan or whatever it was you, you sent to us. And I noticed in there, it always says the county and the city. So, I mean, there are nine cities in the county. And I, I fought this a whole lot when I was on the city commission in the city of Alachua. And we're not an outlier. We're not an outlying community. But when it comes to when you and it says it, talking about community and being able to, you know, to maybe talk with community members about, you know, this project, because if I'm if I'm thinking about it and I'm working with schools and things like that, when you say community, I'm hoping this is all inclusive, but it doesn't. It's not alluding to that. So I wanted to make sure that when we're talking, you say the county and the city are doing these things. I wanted to make sure that it's all inclusive because I, I want all of us to be inclusive in what it is in GRU. We don't get our energy from GRU. So we got to take in consideration other municipalities and you know how this is going to benefit all of us. And we want to get everybody on, on board to make sure that it's all inclusive. And that's all I have. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, uh, Bonnie. Uh, yes, thank you, Bonnie. So uh, I, I think what you're reading is the zero waste plan. So the zero waste plan was developed specifically by the county and the city of Gainesville. The, the comprehensive plan policy language that we're talking about, that just applies to unincorporated Alaska County. That being said, when, when we were developing that joint plan between the city of Gainesville and Alachua County, we did have a number of meetings and we invited representatives from the other cities. Uh, but the plan itself, you know, we used a consultant to develop a plan and that was paid by Alachua County and the city of Gainesville. And that's why you only see those two names there. Okay, well, we're gonna change that. <laughs> Your uh, invitations are great, but you know, I, I've always been outspoken, especially when it comes to my environment. And what I was hoping today, and this is the last thing I promise, guys, I was hoping for a civil bullet, you know, the, the, on how we could we could just end all of everything that you guys talked about today. But from the from the from the looks of it, and from the sound of it, it appears. And for me, I do better in person. Okay, meeting in the parking lot is not going to work for me. This Zoom thing, I'm old school, you know, and I understand where your mask. I've been vaccinated. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't have to last two hours, but meeting one day. For those of us who work, um, I just like to say, Mark, five o'clock is not going to be good for me. So it's going to have to be, you know, in the evening uh, like this. Uh, if if everybody else is on board with that, I mean, I could if I got have enough time, then I could. But I like I don't want to be in my office when I do this. I want to be you know, in my setting where I feel comfortable saying what I need to say and not on time. So just please take that in consideration that we're going to do something and it's coming up real quick. Uh, then just let me know in advance. Or Thank you very much. Thanks, Bonnie. Okay, so we're going to what does everyone want to do? We we want to have a subcommittee meeting before regular meeting. Um, Bonnie prefers meeting person. And Bonnie, what we're talking about, um, yeah, the park prefers meeting in person. Um, and I has a, a little bit of a different opinion well, that's on okay. what their preferences. I appreciate it um, for sure, and I think that um, there's some of um, I, um, I, you know, I, I, I kind of, you know, the COVID thing is is kind of coming back a little bit. I've what from what I've heard. You know, um, but it's okay. I just need time to read over. It. Everything. I'm hoping in the future after I'm going to say it after COVID and monkeypox and all of the other things <laughs> that we maybe one day in the future, we may be able to um, to meet. But
but yeah, anybody else. Okay, but Bonnie, and I, um, I don't know if, if you're familiar with like the, on the bottom Zoom, there's like the react button. And if you press that, there's a button. And if you feel like you're trying to get a word in and you can't, which happens a lot in this board, um, raise hand button up um, kind of lets me know that you have a question. And, uh, I, I'll do my best to, you know, fit you fit you in there. Between me. I just don't. <laughs> I told you I was old school. All I can see is what I can see. So I'll take my Zoom classes this week in compliance next time. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Um. Yeah. So um. So does first of all, um, for a subcommittee meeting, work for those of us who want to come to a subcommittee meeting. It's what day this. is that? What day? That, that would Wednesday. be Wednesday. Yes, that's fine by me. Um, would it be? I, um, I, so I'm sorry. Um, I, I just want to say, uh, I would, I would also plan of maybe as soon as August starting to move back to in-person, even if we're, I miss seeing people, um, <laughs> it, I think it actually, it's helpful to be able to can through Zoom and it's a lot used to that are on Zoom. Um, so I, I would be favor in favor of kind of moving back to we're going to be a fair amount of discussion on these things. And so the vote is going to be challenging unless that's following a hour plus conversation. Well, what I, what um, I was suggesting, Scott, was we meet and then schedule something the following day, which is an in-person, okay, okay. just like, like. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. And by the way, you, you know, I think, or maybe the month before that, we said we agreed that we should start meeting in person. And the problem media than ever, so to speak, in this new form. So you know, from from my, but I'm not sure it's wise, especially for someone you know of my doing that. So um, you know, perhaps we can look at you know. Uh, move to a some kind of a hybrid meeting where we you know we are all meeting in person but just you know if you're a wimp like me and you want to meet you know over only over zoom we can still in some way well you know is, in, in fairness and i appreciate what bonnie was saying hybrid is the only way that you could possibly go because we all know that not all the members are going to meet in a room it's just not it's been over two years since we've physically met and Staffs, I mean, it, the committee's been able to move along with this, but you know, it's, it's it, you know, I personally have to take in consideration the risk concerns for all the committee members, not just the few that want that feel comfortable enough to meet in person. And so, from that perspective, you know, if you can't even if you cannot get a quorum in a physical setting then there's no reason to have a physical meeting. So I think, you know, I think that that's the other benefit of go, going virtual. So I think what we, you know, suggested on meeting on the 20th, and I can schedule one for the meeting on the 21st for meet out in the parking lot to have, you know, whatever few members want to show up to sign it. But the reality is there too. The problem is if you don't get enough quorum, to physically be there, then that is not a signable meeting either. So I think the question is more that that what Gus was alluding, alluding to is like, you know, this could be a suggestion in terms of, and we can check and see how the board's going to address it, but rather than have a, a vote that basically if you are um, supportive of what the ranking that that solid waste is proposing, then basically you're just confirming what they, you know, want to, in terms of the selection process. So, you know, that may be from that standpoint, you're not even have to, we can draft, you know, 
a, a, a letter of support and then doesn't have a, a voting aspect. So that's something we can look into, but um, you know, it, you know, it's just one of those situations where, you know, not just with COVID, but you know, the situation in terms of realistically members who contacted me and there are a lot of them have said they prefer Zoom because it is, they don't have to leave the house, not only because of the COVID issue, but it's from a standpoint of, you know, time and effort to, to get together and meet when it just, it's logistically not the best for everyone. So, um, but again, yep. you know, that's, that's up to the board, the committee's discretion. Mark, a, a quick question. I, I mean, I definitely understand why some people like to meet on Zoom. I mean, I was cooking dinner during the first part of this meeting. Um, so <laughs> um, having time away from home is challenging for me. I definitely would agree with Bonnie that I, I need to meet later. I can't meet at five o'clock. That's within my no, work no. day. And the only reason that um, was mentioned, Scott, was the past subcommittee meetings, yeah. a lot of times they were at five o'clock because that's what the committee wanted. But six o'clock is fine too. Is, um, so and, the other question I had though, is there a meeting space that would give us more space or are people willing to just wear masks? I guarantee all of us are doing more risky behaviors right now than sitting in a room with each other wearing masks. I think masks are essential. The surge is real. And I know people who have been victims of super spreading events. Oh, I do too. I mean, I know I, I, I know a ton of people right now that have COVID. That being said, it's most likely going to have burned through a bit like a wildfire by the time early August rolls around. So I, I would be okay wearing a mask and I can't speak for everyone else. I'm just wondering if we could also get a space that's maybe a bit larger where people can spread out a bit more. That would help. I mean, I would sit outside to be completely honest. I don't really care. <laughs> so. Well, the problem with that, Scott, is that you really, you've seen the presentations. You have to have, that's another benefit virtual. Basically, all the presentations that are given to EPAC are PowerPoints. And so, you know, that makes sense from the standpoint of, you know, having the virtual. So otherwise, you know, you know, committee members sitting around talking, unless you have something visual to review, it, it's kind of limiting. Now, having said that, we do have that capability, obviously, in conference room A, but again, the, then that becomes a, a, you know, size issue in terms of, and it's like, to go to the logistics of having it in another, like the administration building, okay. when I'm willing to bet 90% chance you're not going to get a quorum, I mean, that's, okay. you know, you're asking a lot there. And so I think, again, it's like, you know, I hate to put it this way, embrace the technology, you know, and, and the, the and, thing you is, know, Mark, every, you know, people want not, to meet physically meet, but I'm like, in light of the COVID situation, I mean, you know, as George, to be honest, though, that is just rolling with a wildfire. So we're not doing our job though right now because we can't vote on things. I agree. So well, that's that's the simple fact. And there that, is and a that, solution to this too, and that's and that's that's what we've been talking about. Look, we 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 agree amongst ourselves at after a regular meeting when we come to you know something that is a consensus that we've reached. Even those who may have voted against it, you know, should agree to this. That we'll all go to the parking lot. We'll stand behind our cars, you know, close enough to where we can yell to each other, you know, what 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 the vote is for. We'll have already decided ahead of time what it's for, and then we'll just you know vote the you know vote for it or against it, you know, and it'll either pass or it'll fail at that point in time, and we'll get in our cars and drive home. So that's the actual process that, that actually allows us to meet the, the legal um, you know, commitment of voting as, as a group in person. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's, um, it just makes it easier for everyone under that kind of situation. But. So for the time being, um, why don't we do the, the virtual meeting um, on the 20th? with a follow-up on the 21st in person that's just kind of um, in at the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, if we feel like we'll have, we'll have uh, drafted everything we need to vote on by then. Um, and then, um, well, I don't know gets, if we want- That kind of gets to let you know, technically I've got to advertise that too. See, that's the problem with, yeah. you know, <laughs> 
you know, I've got it tomorrow. I have to advertise for the 20th and the 21st. And I welcome anyone who's willing to park their car in in the in the EPD parking lot and stand behind it, you know, and listen to our our discussing, you know, of of that. And we should definitely then, you know, ask if we see someone who we don't know. And of course, that's unfortunate. There's half the committee we don't yet know well, but um, you know, we make the, we make the you know offer to for anyone who any citizens present can speak, or you know, anyone else wants to speak. And then you know, we will have already decided in the previous meeting, perhaps, but we'll still have that. You can change your vote. Nothing to say you can't do that between the time we make our decision. But um, you know, and then we vote. It's that simple. Which I, I think you can leave. Um, so, sorry, we should have probably. Thank you. Thank you. That. I just. I appreciate it. I just wanted to let you know. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks, you, Rich. Thanks, um, Rich. Yeah, so, um, and, and sorry, I kind of, I was reading Rich's thing. I missed what everyone said at the, the tail end of that. Um, are, are we it, all on it's... board for doing for doing Zoom in the middle of the month and then maybe a TBD or or just kind of seeing where COVID goes for the April, for the August meeting, or um... so. So honestly, Nisha, what it sounds like is I am in the vast minority here. Um, it seems like most people want to stay virtual. Um, I do at least for for this I'm month up. because I'm in the vast minority. All right. So if they <laughs> you, don't want you and me both, buddy. I cannot find my raise hand button, Madam Chair. So please forgive me. Okay. Uh, I mean, if it's this much of a big deal, I just wanted to express where I was with it. So whatever we do, just make sure we have all everything that we need prior to the meetings, and then we'll just Zoom it so everybody can stop crying. Okay. And it's after 8 o'clock, so if you're ready, you need a Yeah, motion. exactly. Sure. Bonnie, but I'll just I'll just let you know everything uh, we talk about it in this uh, board is a big deal. It, it ends up being a, a big argument. So okay, I, I, I'm it's finding that out. I was not. <laughs> this is not what I signed up for. Okay. <laughs> but um, yeah. So okay. Um, we'll do Zoom for the subcommittee meeting. Um, and then I, you know, looking at the situation with COVID and all that. Um. For, for August? Yeah, I, I've got a couple. Uh, Stacy was asking about the potential of, and this is something we can discuss, you know, but in, of meeting on August the 8th, I think, or not the second, but the, the following week. But we can discuss that so that it can accommodate her schedule in terms of a presentation. So, um, but uh, yeah, here it is, August 8th. That would be a Monday night. Uh, but yeah, I refer to the, the committee on what you want to do. I, I, I told Stacy I'll bring it to bring it to the committee and see what y'all prefer. But um, it is because of juggling vacation issues and stuff. So, you know, uh, they might be able to have somebody there on the, the second, but. Nisha, what you, Stacey want you to talk coordinated about? with Stacy Mastrazo on the uh, second from uh, Florida Wildlife. Um, I mean, Wildflower, and so we would have to, uh, you know, coordinate with her to see if she can move it to the eighth as well. Is is Stacy's meeting? Is Stacy's subject um, like a time sensitive thing that we we need to discuss before a BOCC no. meeting? Stacy's Stacy's is yes. Stacy Greco, not. Matata. Great, great Greco, yeah. But she she's looking at just providing some update on conservation, water conservation issues, and um, in prepping prepping for a presentation to the board at the end of the month, end of August. So, um, um, Nisha, can I propose that we all take the time? or everyone that can takes the time to review the packages that came in for the RFP and that we send maybe our responses to Mark and we just give ourselves maybe a week to look at those. We send comments to Mark, he can then circulate those and we can maybe have some of this conversation through email. Um, otherwise, that we, then we don't run into the two week deadline. We can't in terms of having to notice. 
we can't directly discuss with each other, but we can discuss through Mark, I believe. Yeah, that's true. So I, think, I, I mean, I think we need you're, to you're, you're suggesting this in addition to having a meeting on the 20th. I, I just don't know what the meeting on the 20th does because we would then have to, as Mark said, have a second meeting that's also advertised on the 21st to actually vote on anything. I'm not convinced we're going to have come to an agreement on the 20th that means we can vote on anything. And so then there's gonna be this zombie meeting that will have been noticed that's not gonna happen or Mark's gonna to have to show up for. Um, Poor Mark. So. But, but Scott, if we're not <laughs> no, making no. any progress, if we're not making any progress, we can just dismiss the meeting. I mean, you know, there's no reason we can't just make it a real short meeting if that's what's happening. The idea is I think that we, between now and then we have a chance to review the, the, you know, the documents that are sent to us. No matter what we do, we need to do that. We need to take a deeper dive into what's there. We need to, you know, if we need to get clarification and, you know, send something to Mark, to you know, to ask uh, you know, uh, you know the one of the you know the people from the company further information on fine, but then the purpose of our meeting is to get together and say, okay, here's the here's what we here's what I found out from reading that, and I no longer support it, or you know I read it and I do support it now, and then you know to propose our ideas in terms of changes to the to the comp plan. Do we want to or not make the not make uh, changes to the comp plan, or do we just want to send you know ind independent um, comments to the commissioners you know so that they understand you know that what we'd like. I mean, there's a number of things we can do, but I don't think we want to just give up the opportunity of meeting. Go ahead, Bonnie. I'm just found the, the hand button. I'm just checking. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm done>. Yay! <laughs> right, so what do we say? I don't want to leave before we um let's I, I guess let's shoot for the meeting on the 20. I don't know if it makes sense to then have an in-person meeting on the 21st or yeah. if on the uh, the thing is Mark will have already noticed the meeting on August 2nd by the 20th is could we in theory vote at that Gus said he could likely slip something into the board package if we voted on August 2nd so do zoom on the 20th and in person on August 2nd yeah, I, prefer to be, I prefer the in-person uh, to be the following the, on the 21st for one reason only. That gives us the, if, if we if we meet on the 20th and we're, you know, and we're we're having uh, an in-person meeting on that day, we really have, we're there, okay? And that's it. If we just meet, you know, long enough to, to, you know, to come to conclusions that we know what we want to do, you know, as a committee, formally, legally, you know, by meeting together in person, then there's no reason for us to have to come together for two hours to do that. We can come together for five or 10, 15 minutes and do that. You realize though, I, I mean, David, just to be completely honest, a five minute meeting is an hour's worth of my time. It, for me too. So, so I mean, I, I guess all I'm getting at is like, it's, you're, it's, it's essentially another hour of time I will be committing. So if we have a two hour meeting on the 20th, it will then be another hour of my time the next day. So that is that is challenging for me. I'm not going to lie. Is there a way that we can just um, do a meeting on the 20th and and like draft a, a letter or one of us can draft a letter that we don't have to vote on? Or is there is there some way we can get a consensus feedback to um, to the board or to Gus without without having to vote on it? I, I refer to Gus on that. That's a good question, though. I've, I've questioned that myself. Because the vote thing is just throwing us all for a loop here. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the, the cleanest thing for me would be a, a, a board approved letter. But if you can't do that because you're doing workshops, you know, I'll, I'll get whatever you can give me. I mean, if you meet on, on the 20th and, and you're pretty much in agreement of what you want to say, but you just cannot vote on it, I can just convey that to the board. Okay. And, and I mean, then, I kind of like, I kind of, I don't know. But, I, I mean, if I like that, it's I mean, not, personally, I think it'd be easier that way. I, I know everybody's going through all this logistics because this is why Tallahassee, you know, is playing the game. And so, but it, it, it does make sense in terms of like, if, if there is a consensus on the 20th and I, I great, I appreciate Scott's, you know, suggestion is that everybody look at that proposals, you know, 
before then so that they feel comfortable with with asking any questions rather than just you know blindly you know not address issues and so maybe the, that you know we can keep the 21st as a as a placeholder and if it's not necessary it's not necessary but the 20th you know you might be able to in the meeting say well we feel like you know that this is a consensus and you know and and let gus know and he could go from there and, and by the way there's no reason why once we've reached a consensus we can't just have you know, a, a quorum of, of people meet, you know, not everyone doesn't have to meet for that. The idea is, is that we've already made our, you know, we've already really come to that consensus. We know whether, you know, whether it's something that we're going to authorize Nisha to, you know, put together and send a document to the committee commission on, or whether we're not going to do that, or whether, you know, I mean, we'll already have been decided on the 20th. And so if someone, you know, one or more people don't want to show up at that meeting, that's right. So, uh, Mark, I have a quick question that maybe solves this or maybe is a stupid idea. Is there a workaround for this where we essentially send an email to you designating someone as a proxy for us so that only one person needs to show us? Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Take that stage. I, I give you A for thinking out of the box. And, uh, I tell you, uh, I don't know if anybody's tried that. Um, Let's do it. Um, so I have a really you can question. vote in spirit, you know. So Mark, we're doing what I mean, Tallahassee uh, wants right now. You yeah. have problems, Mark, Gus. What are we voting on? Are we voting on the? I'm I'm, I'm a little confused. Are we are voting? to agree because I really don't want anybody else speaking for me. I want to be able to you know, say what, um, in writing, of course, um, what my thoughts are, okay? And I wanted to know if we're voting on whether you're going to move forward with me sitting down with these companies that presented today, are we voting on just the plastics? Are we voting on just, you know, I mean, what as, as a whole? Because if I could have a nutshell, the old girl will have something to work with. Thank oh, you. I appreciate it. Uh, Gus, what, you know, is it like a ranking of the proposals or? So the, the three proposals were ranked. Florida Environmental, Florida Express came on top. The committee decided to recommend that the board authorize staff to negotiate only with uh, Florida Environmental. And to just look at the other proposals. And it's our opinion that they don't meet the current comprehensive plan requirement. So what you could vote is either to say, no, we disagree, I think they do meet the current plan, or it could meet the current plan if you're a little bit more flexible in their interpretation, or it doesn't mean, but you know what, you need to change the language. So you got a lot of leeway, but Essentially, the board has to give us the direction to kind of change our recommendation. And then at that point, we would talk to one or both of those facilities again. So if you don't, under that scenario, if, if you choose to change the comprehensive plan, could there be a challenge issued by, you know, one of the proposers or? Actually, based, uh, yes. on what Gus, based on what Gus said, I think it's more a matter of, of, you know, a letter to the commission stating that, you know, the original intent um, was to prevent waste to energy burning, you know, of plastics, blah, blah, blah. And you know, not necessarily, we may not even have to change the, uh, the comp plan other than to say, you know, to the, not to, not change the comp plan, but to say to the commission that what, you know, we think that it's being perhaps mis- translated or you know based on our intent here's the intent and what we had and and you know they're sticking to the letter of the law which is okay but here's what we really wanted to see happen when we you know when we made our recommendations on that day to the board and i think that could have in, enough influence to get them to say okay yeah we agree you know that that perhaps you know uh we can take a different take a new look at the proposals under those you know um with those with that in mind go ahead linda 
question about the points for each of those proposals. Um, maybe I missed it or I missed a, a document in the emails, but um, d I'm assuming those points were awarded, awarded per certain criteria or rubric. Um, it, is that something that can be shared with us so that we could see how those points, you know, add up and where the shortfalls were? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can share that information, but it, it, it boils down to, for, for example, I was in the committee. I was one of the people who were awarding points. So the way I approach that is, okay, so clean sweep doesn't meet the compliant requirements. I gave zero for everything else. Some other, board me some other committee members, they gave him less points than zero. I mean, sorry, more points than zero. So... I wouldn't get too hung up on the point system because like I said, we could have two facilities. So, I mean, but I can certainly provide that information for you and for no, the rest of the committee. Well, I think that's helpful because I think if we were to weigh each criteria differently, that could help us, you know, come to a more objective analysis of the, of the different um, proposals. It sounds like each person decided what was most important to them in reviewing the proposal. I think that can be that can be hard to evaluate as well. Oh, that's that. Yeah. Um, I, so I have I have one final comment, and then I know I want to, and everyone else wants to leave. Um, if if we have a meeting and we recommend a change to the comp plan approach, it is going to essentially, and, and the commission acts on that in any way, it is going to throw out the work that was done as part of our, this RFP. I don't think that we meet on the 20th. I think we set this as an agenda item, possibly for the next meeting, and just have that as the focus of the meeting. I think we can, I don't, I don't think people on the call had an issue with recommending um, the CND project move forward. I think we all view that as an acceptable project. So I think maybe we just have a letter that says, we think that's an acceptable project. That project should move forward. I think this bigger question on the comp plan is something we need to probably discuss in more detail. And it's not time pressing if we let the RFP move forward as completed. We will, if, if, if they act on any comments, it will absolutely, the results of this RFP selection will get shredded. <laughs> um, and it Scott, will have kind of all been for naught. Scott, question on that. You know, what about the idea of, you know, of, of, of presenting the commission with the idea that perhaps the, you know, the, the way the comp plan is being interpreted is not necessarily in keeping with the intent of the language that we asked to be put into it. The, the thing is all the rankings have been done at this point it will literally throw out the results of this RFP. I think there is a bigger question here. I don't think it's being misinterpreted. <laughs> I think there is an argument here that both of the processes that were discussed are producing energy in the form of diesel in one case, in the form is either of pellets or natural gas in the other case, that is an energy source. Um, I think that's waste of energy. Uh, so I, I don't think they are interpreting it wrong. I think it's a bad rule and the rule needs to be revisited, and that should happen outside of the selection. I don't think it makes sense to kill one good project to potentially try to get a second one. They can't re-rank these things now. That's not how the RFP process works. So I don't think Gus and his group can get together and reevaluate these. What is okay. done is done in that regard, because um, it would just be open for rampant corruption if that was the case. Um, so that RFP process doesn't work that way. There's essentially an open meeting when they review these and then those scores are set in stone. They don't change um, or the whole process gets thrown out. Scott, the only thing I can say is, is that at the time we made our recommendations, um, I had never you know, heard of any proposal that would have allowed someone to do what they're doing in terms of converting the, you know, uh, plastics and other things into, into a fuel, okay? They talked about just burning those things outright. Now, it's the same difference, though. You're just talking about semantic differences there. It's the same thing. I don't think it is. So they're, also is. Build, they're also building I, a wood, I would like to hear what Gus has to say, too, about this um, in so terms if, of how we can be helpful. Sure. So if I may, I mean, Scott is correct. 
I mean, we are not going to change our scores. We're not going to change our score based on EPAC recommendations or on EDAC recommendations. Like I said, the, the scores are set in stone. But I think you can have it. You can do both. You can say we agree with the rankings. Period. However, there's an issue with your policy, and that needs to be further there need to be further discussions on that. So, this score can trigger a future action by EPAC and by the board. Does that make any sense? I mean, you don't have to solve everything on the 20th. You can just decide to agree with staff's recommendation or make your recommendation that, yeah, you support the CND MRF. However, you know, you would like to have discussion on the, either on the comprehensive policy language or the interpretation of the comprehensive policy language. I, I, I mean, they're actually two different things. Te technically, Gus, we have six members on right now, which is a quorum, I believe. Could we, in theory, say that we are in proposed? Nobody leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could we say that? Could we say that we're in favor, though, of the staff ranking and that that should move forward, and then just plan to have this separate meeting to say, and we think the comprehensive plan needs to be revisited. I mean, I, I can take that to the board that, you know, we had a meeting, it was discussed by consensus, I, I, feedback, you know. I don't see needing a second meeting. If, if, honestly, at that point, I think we should just meet on the 21st, just to, we can essentially come up with language for this, but it would be something along the lines of feedback supports the selection made by county staff relative to this RFP number and is in support of the rankings moving forward. In which case, we don't need to have the meeting on the 20th, we would just need to have a meeting to vote on that to give it the additional weight. And then we just need to revisit this. I think we need to, I think this goes down and there's something that needs to be revisited. I don't see us reaching resolution on that, to be completely honest in one meeting. Yeah, I mean, keep keep in mind, like from, from my, the eco loop point of view, I mean, this is just the beginning. It doesn't end up here. We still got more available land that we need to leave. Yeah. This, there's no, I mean, no realistically, yeah. <laughs> realistically, neither of the other companies can be selected as part of this. And Scott, even if you and I were to come to a complete agreement, you know, tonight or 20th or 21st or whatever, it would still be something we have to get feedback from stakeholders on it to really, you know. Of course. Yeah. So. That, that's something that's going to take longer, you know, than just, you know, us getting together once or twice. Yeah, so that, that I guess is maybe, could we just have a single meeting, Nisha, where people show up in person for the five minutes? We had sent around a resolution language before that, and we just show up for the vote, and we just make the resolution relatively innocuous. So it says something along the lines of, that way, that way one project can get started. Yeah, <laughs> so, I, I like that. We should probably still meet for the, another five or ten minutes on the twentieth to, to you know to review that and it, whatever. I, David, I I literally I can't right now. I've been in a meeting for two and a half hours, ignoring my children. So we can. I mean, it's we can. Not we can. For me. <laughs> we can meet for you know fifteen minutes in the parking lot if we want to just have a quick yes. okay discussion around it, and then um, we'll we'll have already like Mark can already provide um, if for example if I come with some language for the proposal based on what we've all been discussing, he can um, pass that on to everybody so that you can review it um, ahead of the 21st and then we can just meet. Um, and if there are any just like, um, you know, fine points that anybody wants to adjust on it um, or if anybody has a discrepancy or whatever, um, we can we can all just kind of quickly handle that and then take a vote. Okay, is my, that bottom, my bottom line on this is, one, is, is only this, is that I wanna see every member have you know have 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 agree with whatever we finally come up with. I don't want anyone left yeah. out of that decision, including Scott, who may be 180 degrees from where I'm at right now. But it's a matter. Yeah, I mean, of I think I think what we're kind of trying to come up with is something that's it's it's a little bit less um, um, aggressive, or or um, you yep. know, we're not really trying to make leaps and bounds here. We're just trying to say. Um, like yes, um, you know, like let's go ahead and move forward with the the C and D project and um, we need to reconsider um, either the interpretation of the language in the, um, 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 I lost the word, in our- The comprehensive plan. Comp yeah. plan, yeah. yeah. Um, we need to either need to 
reconsider the, the language in the comprehensive plan or reconsider our interpretation of that language. And that's going to take time to do because I'll be honest. But we're not going to go into the specifics of that. No, we're not going into the specifics. Right. Right. Yeah. We're just going to say that's that. That's the way to go. That's the way to go then. Definitely. Okay. So let's, Nisha, can we just circulate something? Let's shoot for circulating something a week from now. Let's plan on having a meeting either on the 20th or on the 21st just to vote on this simple resolution. An in-person meeting. Yes, an in-person 10 or 15 minute meeting in a parking lot. Perfect. I love that it's in a parking lot. Bring it just sounds so around. like. <laughs> well, if it's downtown, there's never any parking in Gainesville. So I'll probably have to do a drive by, you know, <laughs> out the window or something. But I remember somebody saying that they weren't going to be, they're going to be out of the country on the 21st. So I the think Linda. Yeah, oh, yeah. so what state. works better? What works, Linda, are you gonna, would you be available on the 20th? Or no, what works I'll better? be out of state. I'll be out of state then. Okay. Um, so, so out of the 21st and the 20th, what works better for everyone else? What days are those two on? Uh, they're a Wednesday and a Thursday. I mean, we could also do it the following week um, if if that's better for you, Linda. The Wednesday on the, the Wednesday is better. That, that's the 20th. That would be, you know, in the evening on the 20th. Yeah. Well, I, like Nisha said, it could be the following week. I mean, it, it, it's, it's as long as you, Gus gets it before the second. Um, yeah. But I, I got to agree with what was said because, you know, when Scott kind of started talking, I was thinking, yeah, he's right, because this is not comparing apples and oranges. This is apples and airplanes. I mean, it's yeah. <laughs> those three proposals. I mean, with the comp plan kind of lingering as an issue, it's like, well, how can I mean, Gus, his hands were tied on his ranking because, you know, it, it didn't meet the comp plan. So, but again, I think that's why they, the board, I mean, the BOCC has to make a decision whether to, you know, you know, look at that whole, open it up that issue and address it separately, you know, so. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, I think too, the thing, um, it, it seems like we're all more or less in agreement with you know what you're suggesting scott in terms of our our recommendation um, um at least to that extent i mean i think there's a lot more debate to be had around um you know the whether or not you know pursuing um waste to energy um you know burning plastics all that stuff whether or not that that comes about or, or what we all think about that but just the piece about um you know moving forward with the c and d project and um, just taking a look at the yes. um, the comp plan language, um, I think we're all kind of in agreement on that. So, um, so you know, I, I think we can have a relatively quick meeting, um, you know, a couple weeks from now, and and just handle that piece. Does, regarding, does the the comp, regarding the comp plan language, is there an anticipated deadline for? achieving some resolution to that months from now? How, how much time is there available? I, I would say we maybe discuss that at the August 2nd meeting. If we don't have yeah. Time. Let's go ahead and just nail in a meeting yeah. um, and, 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 and move on with our lives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how about the 20th? You the big bucks, all right? We appreciate you. <laughs> 20th at six o'clock. How does that sound? That works for me. Okay. Got night. You are the bomb. Well, we can't say that nowadays. Uh, six o'clock is great. Right? <laughs> That's an That's in-person right, meeting guys. in the parking lot of EPD, right? <laughs> well, uh, no, yeah. literally. But yeah. Mr. Brown, just send me my marching order, sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. It's, this, it's the same media uh, building we used to meet at, right? Years ago. <laughs> yes. That's so depressing remember. when you say it that way. <laughs> I know. So depressing. Right? Yeah, I need directions. Uh, I need directions yeah. for that. I'm not sure I remember where it is. <laughs> I know. Right. Or like you'll recognize it now. I, I, I hardly ever go to downtown Gainesville. And like the last time I was there, I was just like, where am I? It just looks completely different. Okay. All right, everyone. I make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Yes. All, all in favor?
Woo! Woo! Uh, <laughs> Madam Chair, can we go? Bye, everybody. Yes, Bonnie, thank you for sticking around. Bye, everybody. Bye. Okay, bye. 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 bye.